Book three, sections ten to thirteen of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book three, sections ten through thirteen. Section ten. There is also a doubt as to what is to be the supreme power in the state. Is it the multitude, or the wealthy, or the good, or the one best man, or a tyrant? Any of these alternatives seems to involve disagreeable consequences. If the poor, for example, because they are more in number, divide among themselves the property of the rich, is not this unjust? No, by heaven, will be the reply, for the supreme authority justly willed it. But if this is not injustice, pray what is? Again, when in the first division all has been taken, and the majority divide anew the property of the minority, is it not evident, if this goes on, that they will ruin the state? Yet surely virtue is not the ruin of those who possess her, nor is justice destructive of a state. And therefore this law of confiscation clearly cannot be just. If it were, all the acts of a tyrant must of necessity be just, for he only coerces other men by superior power, just as the multitude coerce the rich. But is it just, then, that the few and the wealthy should be the rulers? And what if they, in like manner, rob and plunder the people? Is this just? If so, the other case will likewise be just. But there can be no doubt that all these things are wrong and unjust. Then, ought the good to rule and have supreme power? But in that case, everybody else, being excluded from power, will be dishonoured, for the offices of a state are posts of honour and if one set of men always holds them, the rest must be deprived of them. Then will it be well that the one best man should rule? Nay, that is still more oligarchical, for the number of those who are dishonoured is thereby increased. Someone may say that it is bad in any case for a man, subject as he is to all the accidents of human passion, to have the supreme power, rather than the law. But what if the law itself be democratical or oligarchical? How will that help us out of our difficulties? not at all. The same consequences will follow. Most of these questions may be reserved for another occasion. The principle that the multitude ought to be supreme, rather than the few best, is one that is maintained, and, though not free from difficulty, yet seems to contain an element of truth. For the many, of whom each individual is but an ordinary person, when they meet together may very likely be better than the few good, if regarded not individually but collectively just as a feast to which many contribute is better than a dinner provided out of a single purse. For each individual among the many has a share of virtue and prudence, and when they meet together they become in a manner one man, who has many feet and hands and senses, that is a figure of their mind and disposition. Hence the many are better judges than a single man of music and poetry, for some understand one part and some another, and among them they understand the whole. There is a similar combination of qualities in good men who differ from any individual of the many, as the beautiful are said to differ from those who are not beautiful, and works of art from realities, because in them the scattered elements are combined, although, if taken separately, the eye of one person, or some other feature in another person, would be fairer than in the picture. Whether this principle can apply to every democracy, and to all bodies of men, is not clear or rather, by heaven, in some cases it is impossible of application, for the argument would equally hold about brutes, and wherein, it will be asked, do some men differ from brutes. But there may be bodies of men about whom our statement is nevertheless true, and if so, the difficulty which has been already raised, and also another which is akin to it, that is, what power should be assigned to the mass of free men and citizens who are not rich and have no personal merit, are both solved. There is still a danger in allowing them to share the great offices of state, for their folly will lead them into error, and their dishonesty into crime. But there is a danger also in not letting them share, for a state in which many poor men are excluded from office will necessarily be full of enemies. The only way of escape is to assign to them some deliberative and judicial functions. For this reason Solon and certain other legislators give them the power of electing to offices, and of calling the magistrates to account but they do not allow them to hold office singly. When they meet together, their perceptions are quite good enough, and combined with the better class they are useful to the state. 
just as impure food, when mixed with what is pure, sometimes makes the entire mass more wholesome than a small quantity of the pure would be. But each individual, left to himself, forms an imperfect judgment. On the other hand, the popular form of government involves certain difficulties. In the first place, it might be objected that he who can judge of the healing of a sick man would be one who could himself heal his disease and make him whole, that is, in other words, the physician, and so in all professions and arts. As then the physician ought to be called to account by physicians, so ought men in general to be called to account by their peers. But physicians are of three kinds. There is the ordinary practitioner, and there is the physician of the higher class, and thirdly, the intelligent man who has studied the art. In all arts there is such a class, and we attribute the power of judging to them quite as much as the professors of the art. Secondly, does not the same principle apply to elections? For a right election can only be made by those who have knowledge. Those who know geometry, for example, will choose a geometrician rightly, and those who know how to steer a pilot. And, even if there be some occupations and arts in which private persons share in the ability to choose, they certainly cannot choose better than those who know. So that, according to this argument, neither the election of magistrates, nor the calling of them to account, should be entrusted to the many. Yet possibly these objections are to a great extent met by our old answer that if the people are not utterly degraded, although individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge, as a body they are as good or better. Moreover, there are some arts whose products are not judged of solely, or best, by the artists themselves, namely those arts whose products are recognized even by those who do not possess the art. For example, the knowledge of the house is not limited to the builder only. The user, or, in other words, the master of the house, will be even a better judge than the builder, just as the pilot will judge better of a rudder than the carpenter, and the guest will judge better of a feast than the cook. This difficulty seems now to be sufficiently answered, but there is another akin to it. That inferior persons should have authority in greater matters than the good would appear to be a strange thing, yet the election and calling to account of the magistrates is the greatest of all. And these, as I was saying, are functions which in some states are assigned to the people, for the assembly is supreme in all such matters. Yet persons of any age, and having but a small property qualification, sit in the assembly, and deliberate, and judge, although for the great officers of state, such as treasurers and generals, a high qualification is required. This difficulty may be solved in the same manner as the preceding, and the present practice of democracies may be really defensible. For the power does not reside in the dicast, or senator, or ecclesiast, but in the court, and the senate and the assembly, of which individual senators, or ecclesiasts, or dicasts, are only parts, or members. And for this reason the many may claim to have a higher authority than the few. For the people, and the senate, and the courts, consist of many persons, and their property, collectively, is greater than the property of one or of a few individuals holding great offices. But enough of this. The discussion of the first question shows nothing so clearly as that laws, when good, should be supreme, and that the magistrate, or magistrates, should regulate those matters only on which the laws are unable to speak with precision, owing to the difficulty of any general principle embracing all particulars. But what are good laws has not yet been clearly explained. The old difficulty remains. The goodness or badness, justice or injustice, of laws varies of necessity with the constitutions of states. This, however, is clear, that the laws must be adapted to the constitutions. But if so, true forms of government will of necessity have just laws, and perverted forms of government will have unjust laws. Section 12 In all sciences and arts the end is a good, and the greatest good, and in the highest degree a good, in the most authoritative of all, this is the political science, of which the good is justice, in other words, the common interest. All men think justice to be a sort of equality, and to a certain extent they agree in the philosophical distinctions which have been laid down by us about ethics, for they admit that justice is a thing, and has a relation to persons, and that equals ought to have equality. But there still remains a question. Equality or inequality of what? Here is a difficulty which calls for political speculation. 
for very likely some persons will say that offices of state ought to be unequally distributed according to superior excellence in whatever respect of the citizen although there is no other difference between him and the rest of the community for that those who differ in any one respect have different rights and claims but surely if this is true the complexion or height of a man or any other advantage will be a reason for his obtaining a greater share of political rights the error here lies upon the surface and may be illustrated from the other arts and sciences when a number of flute players are equal in their art there is no reason why those of them who are better born should have better flutes given to them for they will not play any better on the flute and the superior instrument should be reserved for him who is the superior artist if what i am saying is still obscure it will be made clearer as we proceed for if there were a superior flute player who was far inferior in birth and beauty although either of these may be a greater good than the art of flute playing and may excel flute playing in a greater ratio than he excels the others in his art still he ought to have the best flutes given to him unless the advantages of wealth and birth contribute to excellence in flute playing which they do not moreover upon this principle any good may be compared with any other for if a given height may be measured against wealth and against freedom height in general may be so measured thus if a excels in height more than b in virtue even if virtue in general excels height still more all goods will be commensurable for if a certain amount is better than some other it is clear that some other will be equal but since no such comparison can be made it is evident that there is good reason why in politics men do not ground their claim to office on every sort of inequality any more than in the arts for if some be slow and others swift that is no reason why the one should have little and the others much it is in gymnastics contests that such excellence is rewarded whereas the rival claims of candidates for office can only be based on the possession of elements which enter into the composition of a state and therefore the noble or free-born or rich may with good reason claim office for holders of offices must be freemen and taxpayers a state can be no more composed entirely of poor men than entirely of slaves but if wealth and freedom are necessary elements justice and valor are equally so for without the former qualities a state cannot exist at all without the latter not well section thirteen if the existence of the state is alone to be considered then it would seem that all or some at least of these claims are just but if we take into account a good life then as i have already said education and virtue have superior claims as however those who are equal in one thing ought not to have an equal share in all nor those who are unequal in one thing to have an unequal share in all it is certain that all forms of government which rest on either of these principles are perversions all men have a claim in a certain sense as i have already admitted but all have not an absolute claim the rich claim because they have a greater share in the land and land is the common element of the state also they are generally more trustworthy in contracts the free claim under the same tithe as the noble for they are nearly akin for the noble are citizens in a truer sense than the ignoble and good birth is always valued in a man's own home and country another reason is that those who are sprung from better ancestors are likely to be better men, for nobility is excellence of race virtue too may be truly said to have a claim for justice has been acknowledged by us to be a social virtue and it implies all others again the many may urge their claim against the few for when taken collectively and compared with the few they are stronger and richer and better but what if the good the rich the noble and the other classes who make up a state are all living together in the same city will there or will there not be any doubt who shall rule no doubt at all in determining who ought to rule in each of the above-mentioned forms of government for states are characterized by differences in their governing bodies one of them has a government of the rich another of the virtues and so on but a difficulty arises when all these elements coexist how are we to decide suppose the virtues to be very few in number may we consider their numbers in relation to their duties and to ask whether they are enough to administer the state or so many as will make up a state objections may be urged against all the aspirants to political power for those who found their claims on wealth or family might be thought to have no basis of justice 
On this principle, if any one person were richer than all the rest, it is clear that he ought to be ruler of them. In like manner, he who is very distinguished by his birth ought to have the superiority over all those who claim on the ground that they are free-born. In an aristocracy, or government of the best, a like difficulty occurs about virtue. For if one citizen be better than the other members of the government, however good they may be, he too, upon the same principle of justice, should rule over them. And if the people are to be supreme, because they are stronger than the few, then if one man, or more than one, but not a majority, is stronger than the many, they ought to rule, and not the many. All these considerations appear to show that none of the principles on which men claim to rule and to hold all other men in subjection to them are strictly right. To those who claim to be masters of the government on the grounds of their virtue or their wealth, the many might fairly answer that they themselves are often better and richer than the few. I do not say individually, but collectively. And another ingenious objection which is sometimes put forward may be met in a similar manner. Some persons doubt whether the legislator who desires to make the justice laws ought to legislate with a view to the good of the higher classes, or of the many, when the case which we have mentioned occurs. Now, what is just or right is to be interpreted in the sense of what is equal, and that which is right in the sense of being equal is to be considered with reverence to the advantage of the state, and the common good of the citizens. And a citizen is one who shares in governing and being governed. He differs under different forms of government, but in the best state he is one who is able and willing to be governed and to govern, with a view to the life of virtue. If, however, there be some one person, or more than one, although not enough to make up the full complement of a state, whose virtue is so pre-eminent that the virtues or the political capacity of all the rest admit of no comparison with his or theirs, he or they can be no longer regarded as part of a state for justice will not be done to the superior if he is reckoned only as the equal of those who are so far inferior to him in virtue and in political capacity. Such a one may truly be deemed a god among men. Hence we see that legislation is necessarily concerned only with those who are equal in birth and in capacity, and that for men of pre-eminent virtue there is no law, they are themselves a law. Any would be ridiculous who attempted to make laws for them, they would probably retort what, in the fable of Antisthenes, the lions said to the hares, when in the council of the beasts the latter began haranguing and claiming equality for all. And for this reason democratic states have instituted ostracism. Equality is above all things their aim, and therefore they ostracized and banished from the city, for a time, those who seemed to predominate too much through their wealth, or the number of their friends, or through any other political influence. Mythology tells us that the Argonauts left Heracles behind for a similar reason. The ship Argo would not take him, because she feared that he would have been too much for the rest of the crew. Wherefore those who denounce tyranny and blame the counsel which Periander gave to Thrasybulus cannot be held altogether just in their censure. The story is that Periander, when the herald was sent to ask counsel of him, said nothing, but only cut off the tallest ears of corn, till he had brought the field to a level. The herald did not know the meaning of the action, but came and reported what he had seen to Thrasybulus, who understood that he was to cut off the principal men in the state. And this is a policy not only expedient for tyrants, or in practice confined to them, but equally necessary in oligarchies and democracies. Ostracism is a measure of the same kind, which acts by disabling and banishing the most prominent citizens. Great powers do the same to whole cities and nations, as the Athenians did to the Samians, Caians and lesbians. No sooner had they obtained a firm grasp of the empire than they humbled their allies contrary to treaty. And the Persian king has repeatedly crushed the Medes, Babylonians, and other nations when their spirit has been stirred by the recollection of their former greatness. The problem is a universal one, and equally concerns all forms of government, true as well as false. For, although perverted forms with a view to their own interests may adopt this policy, those which seek the common interest do so likewise. The same thing may be observed in the arts and sciences, for the painter will not allow the figure to have a foot which, however beautiful, is not in proportion, nor will the shipbuilder allow the stem or any other part of the vessel to be unduly large, any more than the chorus-master will allow any one who sings louder or better than all the rest to sing in the choir. 
monarchs too may practice compulsion and still live in harmony with their cities if their own government is for the interest of the state hence where there is an acknowledged superiority the argument in favour of ostracism is based upon a kind of political justice it would certainly be better that the legislator should from the first so order his state as to have no need of such a remedy but if the need arises the next best thing is that he should endeavour to correct the evil by this or some similar measure the principle however has not been fairly applied in states for instead of looking to the good of their own constitution they have used ostracism for factious purposes it is true that under perverted forms of government and from their special point of view such a measure is just and expedient but it is also clear that it is not absolutely just in the perfect state there would be great doubts about the use of it not when applied to excess in strength wealth popularity or the like but when used against some one who is pre-eminent in virtue what is to be done with him mankind will not say that such a one is to be expelled and exiled on the other hand he ought not to be a subject that would be as if mankind should claim to rule over zeus dividing his offices among them the only alternative is that all should joyfully obey such a ruler according to what seems to be the order of nature and that men like him should be kings in their state for life end of book three sections ten through thirteen Book three, sections fourteen through eighteen of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book three, sections fourteen through eighteen. Section fourteen. The preceding discussion, by a natural transition, leads to the consideration of royalty, which we admit to be one of the true forms of government. Let us see whether in order to be well governed, a state or country should be under the rule of a king or under some other form of government, and whether monarchy, although good for some, may not be bad for others. But first we must determine whether there is one species of royalty or many. It is easy to see that there are many and that the manner of government is not the same in all of them. Of royalty is according to law. 1. The Lacedaemonian is thought to answer best to the true pattern, but there the royal power is not absolute, except when the kings go on an expedition, and then they take the command. Matters of religion are likewise committed to them. The kingly office is in truth a kind of generalship, irresponsible and perpetual. The king has not the power of life and death, except in a specified case, as for instance in ancient times he had it when upon a campaign, by right of force. This custom is described in Homer. For Agamemnon is patient when he is attacked in the assembly, but when the army goes out to battle he has the power even of life and death. Does he not say, quote, When I find a man skulking apart from the battle, nothing shall save him from the dogs and vultures, for in my hands is death. End quote. This, then, is one form of royalty, a generalship for life, and of such royalties some are hereditary and others elective. 2. There is another sort of monarchy, not uncommon among the barbarians, which nearly resembles tyranny, but this is both legal and hereditary. For barbarians, being more servile in character than Hellenes, and Asiatics than Europeans, do not rebel against a despotic government. Such royalties have the nature of tyrannies, because the people are by nature slaves. But there is no danger of their being overthrown, for they are hereditary and legal. Wherefore also their guards are such as a king, and not such as a tyrant would employ. That is to say, they are composed of citizens, whereas the guards of tyrants are mercenaries. For kings rule according to law over voluntary subjects, but tyrants over involuntary and the one are guarded by their fellow-citizens, the others are guarded against them. These are two forms of monarchy, and there was a third, three, which existed in ancient Hellas, called an isomnesia, or dictatorship. This may be defined generally as an elective tyranny, which, like the barbarian monarchy, is legal, but differs from it in not being hereditary. Sometimes the office was held for life, sometimes for a term of years, or until certain duties had been performed. 
For example, the Mytilenaeans elected Pittacus leader against the exiles, who were headed by Antimenides and Alcaeus the poet, and Alcaeus himself shows in one of his banquet odes that they chose Pittacus, tyrant, for he reproaches his fellow citizens for, quote, having made the low-born Pittacus tyrant of the spiritless and ill-fated city, with one voice shouting his praises, end quote. These forms of government have always had the character of tyrannies, because they possess despotic power. But inasmuch as they are elective, and acquiesced in by their subjects, they are kingly. 4. There is a fourth species of kingly rule, that of the heroic times, which was hereditary and legal, and was exercised over willing subjects. For the first chiefs were benefactors of the people in arts or arms. They either gathered them into a community, or procured land for them, and thus they became kings of voluntary subjects, and their power was inherited by their descendants. They took the command in war, and presided over the sacrifices, except those which required a priest. They also decided causes, either with or without an oath, and when they swore, the form of the oath was the stretching out of their scepter. In ancient times their power extended continuously to all things whatsoever, in city and country, as well as in foreign parts. But, at a later date, they relinquished several of these privileges, and others the people took from them, until in some states nothing was left to them but the sacrifices, and where they retained more of the reality they had only the right of leadership in war beyond the border. These, then, are the four kinds of royalty. First, the monarchy of the heroic ages. This was exercised over voluntary subjects, but limited to certain functions. The king was a general and a judge, and had the control of religion. The second is that of the barbarians, which is a hereditary despotic government in accordance with law. A third is the power of the so-called Isomnit, or dictator. This is an elective tyranny. The fourth is the Lacedaemonian, which is in fact a generalship, hereditary and perpetual. These four forms differ from one another in the manner in which I have described. 5. There is a fifth form of kingly rule in which one has the disposal of all, just as each nation or each state has the disposal of public matters. This form corresponds to the control of a household. For as household management is the kingly rule of a house, so kingly rule is the household management of a city, or of a nation, or of many nations. Section 15. Of these forms we need only consider two, the Lacedaemonian and the absolute royalty, for most of the others be in a region between them, having less power than the last and more than the first. Thus the inquiry is reduced to two points. First, is it advantageous to the state that there should be a perpetual general, and if so, should the office be confined to one family or open to the citizens in turn? Secondly, is it well that a single man should have the supreme power in all things? The first question falls under the head of laws rather than of constitutions, for perpetual generalship might equally exist under any form of government, so that this matter may be dismissed for the present. The other kind of royalty is a sort of constitution. This we have now to consider, and briefly to run over the difficulties involved in it. We will begin by inquiring whether it is more advantageous to be ruled by the best man or by the best laws. The advocates of royalty maintain that the laws speak only in general terms and cannot provide for circumstances, and that for any science to abide by written rules is absurd. In Egypt, the physician is allowed to alter his treatment after the fourth day, but if sooner, he takes the risk. Hence, it is clear that a government acting according to written laws is plainly not the best. Yet surely the ruler cannot dispense with the general principle which exists in law. And this is a better ruler, which is free from passion, than that in which it is innate. Whereas the law is passionless, passion must ever sway the heart of man. Yes, it may be replied, but then on the other hand, an individual will be better able to deliberate in particular cases. The best man, then, must legislate, and laws must be passed, but these laws will have no authority when they miss the mark, though in all other cases retaining their authority. But when the law cannot determine a point at all, or not well, should the one best man, or should all decide? 
according to our present practice, assemblies meet, sit in judgment, deliberate, and decide, and their judgments all relate to individual cases. Now any member of the assembly, taken separately, is certainly inferior to the wise man, but the state is made up of many individuals. And, as a feast to which all the guests contribute is better than a banquet furnished by a single man, so a multitude is a better judge of many things than any individual. Again, the many are more incorruptible than the few. They are like the greater quantity of water, which is less easily corrupted than a little. The individual is liable to be overcome by anger or by some other passion, and then his judgment is necessarily perverted. But it is hardly to be supposed that the great number of persons would all get into a passion and go wrong at the same moment. Let us assume that they are the free men, and that they never act in violation of the law, but fill up the gaps which the law is obliged to leave. Or, if such virtue is scarcely attainable by the multitude, we need only suppose that the majority are good men and good citizens, and ask which will be the more incorruptible, the one good ruler or the many who are all good? Will not the many? But, you will say, there may be parties among them, whereas the one man is not divided against himself. To which we may answer that their character is as good as his. If we call the rule of many men, who are all of them good, aristocracy, and the rule of one man royalty, then aristocracy will be better for states than the royalty, whether the government is supported by force or not, provided only that the number of men equal in virtue can be found. The first governments were kingships, probably for this reason, because of old, when cities were small, men of eminent virtue were few. Further, they were made kings because they were benefactors, and benefits can only be bestowed by good men. But when many persons equal in merit arose, no longer enduring the pre-eminence of one, they desired to have a commonwealth, and set up a constitution. The ruling class soon deteriorated and enriched themselves out of the public treasury. Riches became the path to honour, and so oligarchies naturally grew up. These passed into tyrannies, and tyrannies into democracies, for love of gain in the ruling classes was always tending to diminish their number, and so to strengthen the masses, who, in the end, set upon their masters and established democracies. Since cities have increased in size, no other form of government appears to be any longer even easy to establish. Even supposing the principle to be maintained that kingly power is the best thing for states, how about the family of the king? Are his children to succeed him? And if they are no better than anybody else, that will be mischievous. But, says the lover of royalty, the king, though he might, will not hand on his power to his children. That, however, is hardly to be expected, and is too much to ask of human nature. There is also a difficulty about the force which he is to employ. Should a king have guards about him, by whose aid he may be able to coerce the refractory? If not, how will he administer his kingdom? Even if he be the lawful sovereign, who does nothing arbitrarily or contrary to law, still he must have some force wherewith to maintain the law. In the case of a limited monarchy, there is not much difficulty in answering this question. The king must have such force as will be more than a match for one or more individuals, but not so great as that of the people. The ancients observe this principle when they have guards to any one whom they appoint a dictator or tyrant. Thus, when Dionysius asked the Syracusans to allow him guards, somebody advised that they should give him only such a number. Section 16. At this place in the discussion there impends the inquiry respecting the king who acts solely according to his own will. He has now to be considered. The so-called limited monarchy, or kingship according to law, as I have already remarked, is not a distinct form of government, for, under all governments, as, for example, in a democracy or aristocracy, there may be a general holding office for life, and one person is often made supreme over the administration of a state. A magistracy of this kind exists at Epidemnus, and also at Opus, but in the latter city has a more limited power. Now, absolute monarchy, or the arbitrary rule of a sovereign over all the citizens, in a city which consists of equals, is thought by some to be quite contrary to nature. 
it is argued that those who are by nature equals must have the same natural right and worth and that for unequals to have an equal share or for equals to have an uneven share in the offices of state is as bad as for different bodily constitutions to have the same food and clothing wherefore it is thought to be just that among equals every one be ruled as well as rule and therefore that all should have their turn we thus arrive at law for an order of succession implies law and the rule of the law it is argued is preferable to that of any individual on the same principle even if it be better for certain individuals to govern they should be made only guardians and ministers of the law for magistrates there must be this is admitted but then men say that to give authority to any one man where all are equal is unjust nay there may indeed be cases which the law seems unable to determine but in such cases can a man nay it will be replied the law trains officers for this express purpose and appoints them to determine matters which are left undecided by it to the best of their judgment further it permits them to make any amendment of the existing laws which experience suggests therefore he who bids the law rule may be deemed to bid god and reason alone rule but he who bids man rule adds an element of the beast for desire is a wild beast and passion perverts the minds of rulers even when they are the best of men the law is reason unaffected by desire we are told that a patient should call in a physician he will not get better if he is doctored out of a book but the parallel of the arts is clearly not in point for the physician does nothing contrary to rule from motives of friendship he only cures a patient and takes a fee whereas magistrates do many things from spite and partiality and indeed if a man suspected the physician of, of being in league with his enemies to destroy him for a bribe he would rather have recourse to the book but certainly physicians when they are sick call in other physicians and training masters when they are in training other training masters as if they could not judge truly about their own case and might be influenced by their feelings hence it is evident that in seeking for justice men seek for the mean or neutral for the law is the mean again customary laws have more weight and relate to more important matters than written laws and a man may be a safer ruler than the written law but not safer than the customary law again it is by no means easy for one man to superintend many things he will have to appoint a number of subordinates and what difference does it make whether these subordinates always existed or were appointed by him because he needed them if as i said before the good man has a right to rule because he is better still two good men are better than one this is the old saying two going together and the prayer of agamemnon would that i had ten such counsellors and at this day there are magistrates for example judges who have authority to decide some matters which the law is unable to determine since no one doubts that the law would command and decide in the best manner whatever it could but some things can and other things cannot be comprehended under the law and this is the origin of the nested question whether the best law or the best man should rule for matters of detail about which men deliberate cannot be included in legislation nor does any one deny that the decision of such matters must be left to man but it is argued that there should be many judges and not one only for every ruler who has been trained by the law judges well and it would surely seem strange that a person should see better with two eyes or hear better with two ears or act better with two hands or feet than many with many indeed it is already the practice of kings to make to themselves many eyes and ears and hands and feet for they make colleagues of those who are the friends of themselves and their governments they must be friends of the monarch and of his government if not his friends they will not do what he wants but friendship implies likeness and equality and therefore if he thinks that his friends ought to rule he must think that those who are equal to himself and like himself ought to rule equally with himself these are the principal controversies relating to monarchy. Section 17 
but may not all this be true in some cases and not in others for there is by nature both a justice and an advantage appropriate to the rule of a master another to kingly rule another to constitutional rule but there is none naturally appropriate to tyranny or to any other perverted form of government for these come into being contrary to nature now to judge at least from what has been said it is manifest that where men are alike and equal it is neither expedient nor just that one man should be lord of all whether there are laws or whether there are no laws but he himself is in the place of law neither should a good man be lord over good men nor a bad man over a bad nor even if he excels in virtue should he have a right to rule unless in a particular case at which i have already hinted and to which i will once more recur but first of all i must determine what natures are suited for government by a king and what for an aristocracy and what for a constitutional government a people who are by nature capable of producing a race superior in the virtue needed for political rule are fitted for kingly government and the people submitting to be ruled as freemen by men whose virtue renders them capable of political command are adapted for an aristocracy while the people who are suited for constitutional freedom are those among whom there naturally exists a warlike multitude able to rule and to obey in turn by a law which gives office to the well-to-do according to their desert but when a whole family or some individual happens to be so pre-eminent in virtue as to surpass all others then it is just that they should be the royal family and supreme over all or that this one citizen should be king of the whole nation for as i said before to give them authority is not only agreeable to that ground of right which the founders of all states whether aristocratical or oligarchical or again democratical are accustomed to put forward for these all recognize the claim of excellence although not the same excellence but accords with the principle already laid down for surely it would not be right to kill or ostracize or exile such a person or require that he should take his turn in being governed the whole is naturally superior to the part and he who has this preeminence is in the relation of a whole to a part but if so the only alternative is that he should have the supreme power and that mankind should obey him not in turn but always these are the conclusions at which we arrive respecting royalty and its various forms and this is the answer to the question whether it is or is not advantageous to states and to which and how section eighteen we maintain that the true forms of government are three and that the best must be that which is administered by the best and in which there is one man or a whole family or many persons excelling all the others together in virtue and both rulers and subjects are fitted the one to rule the others to be ruled in such a manner as to attain the most eligible life we showed at the commencement of our inquiry that the virtue of the good man is necessarily the same as the virtue of the citizen of the perfect state clearly then in the same manner and by the same means through which a man becomes truly good he will frame a state that is to be ruled by an aristocracy or by a king and the same education and the same habits will be found to make a good man and a man fit to be a statesman or a king having arrived at these conclusions we must proceed to speak of the perfect state and describe how it comes into being and is established end of book three sections fourteen through eighteen Book Four, Sections One through Four of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Four, Section One in all arts and sciences which embrace the whole of any subject and do not come into being in a fragmentary way it is the province of a single art or science to consider all that appertains to a single subject for example the art of gymnastic 
considers not only the suitableness of different modes of training to different bodies, two, but what sort is absolutely the best. One, for the absolutely best must suit that which is by nature best and best furnished with the means of life. And also, what common form of training is adapted to the great majority of men, four. And if a man does not desire the best habit of body, or the greatest skill in gymnastics, which might be attained by him, still the trainer or the teacher of gymnastic should be able to impart any lower degree of either. 3. The same principle equally holds in medicine and shipbuilding, and the making of clothes, and in the arts generally. Hence it is obvious that government too is the subject of a single science which has to consider what government is best, and of what sort it must be, to be most in accordance with our aspirations, if there were no external impediment, and also what kind of government is adapted to particular states. For the best is often unattainable, and therefore the true legislator and statesman ought to be acquainted not only with 1. that which is best in the abstract, but also with 2. that which is best relatively to circumstances. We should be able further to say how a state may be constituted under any given conditions. 3. Both how it is originally formed and, when formed, how it may be longest preserved. The supposed state being so far from having the best constitution that it is unprovided even with the conditions necessary for the best. Neither is it the best under the circumstances, but of an inferior type. He ought, moreover, to know, for the form of government which is best suited to states in general. For political writers, although they have excellent ideas, are often unpractical. We should consider not only what form of government is best, but also what is possible, and what is easily attainable by all. There are some who would have none but the most perfect. For this, many natural advantages are required. Others, again, speak of a more attainable form, and, although they reject the constitution under which they are living, they extol someone in particular, for example, the Lacedaemonian. Any change of government which has to be introduced should be one which men, starting from their existing constitutions, will be both willing and able to adopt, since there is quite as much trouble in the reformation of an old constitution as in the establishment of a new one, just as to unlearn is as hard as to learn. And therefore, in addition to the qualifications of the statesman already mentioned, he should be able to find remedies for the defects of existing constitutions, as has been said before. This he cannot do unless he knows how many forms of government there are. It is often supposed that there is only one kind of democracy and one of oligarchy, but this is a mistake, and in order to avoid such mistakes we must ascertain what differences there are in the constitutions of states, and in how many ways they are combined. The same political insight will enable a man to know which laws are the best, and which are suited to different constitutions. For the laws are, and ought to be, relative to the constitution, and not the constitution to the laws. A constitution is the organization of offices in a state, and determines what is to be the governing body, and what is the end of each community. But laws are not to be confounded with the principles of the constitution. They are the rules according to which the magistrates should administer the state, and proceed against offenders so that we must know the varieties and the number of varieties of each form of government, if only with a view to making laws. For the same laws cannot be equally suited to all oligarchies or to all democracies, since there is certainly more than one form both of democracy and of oligarchy. Section 2 In our original discussion about governments, we divided them into three true forms, kingly rule, aristocracy, and constitutional government, and three corresponding perversions, tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. Of kingly rule and of aristocracy we have already spoken, for the inquiry into the perfect state is the same thing with the discussion of the two forms thus named, since both imply a principle of virtue provided with external means. We have already determined in what aristocracy and kingly rule differ from one another, and when the latter should be established. 
In what follows, we have to describe the so-called constitutional government, which bears the common name of all constitutions, and the other forms, tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. It is obvious which of the three perversions is the worst, and which is the next in badness. That which is the perversion of the first and most divine is necessarily the worst. And just as a royal rule, if not a mere name, must exist by virtue of some great personal superiority in the king, so tyranny, which is the worst of governments, is necessarily the farthest removed from all well-constituted form. Oligarchy is little better, for it is a long way from aristocracy, and democracy is the most tolerable of the three. A writer who preceded me has already made these distinctions, but his point of view is not the same as mine, for he lays down the principle that when all the constitutions are good, the oligarchy and the rest being virtuous, democracy is the worst, but the best when all are bad. Whereas we maintain that they are in any case defective, and that one oligarchy is not to be accounted better than another, but only less bad. Not to pursue this question further at present, let us begin by determining 1. How many varieties of constitution there are, since of democracy and oligarchy there are several. 2. What constitution is the most generally acceptable, and what is eligible in the next degree after the perfect state? And besides this, what other there is which is aristocratical and well constituted, and at the same time adapted to states in general? 3. Of the other forms of government to whom each is suited. For democracy may meet the needs of some better than oligarchy, and conversely. In the next place, 4. We have to consider in what manner a man ought to proceed who desires to establish some one among these various forms, whether of democracy or of oligarchy. And lastly, 5. Having briefly discussed these subjects to the best of our power, we will endeavour to ascertain the modes of ruin and preservation both of constitutions generally and of each separately, and to what causes they are to be attributed. Section 3 The reason why there are many forms of government is that every state contains many elements. In the first place, we see that all states are made up of families, and in the multitude of citizens there must be some rich and some poor, and some in a middle condition. The rich are heavy-armed, and the poor not. Of the common people, some are husbandmen, and some traders, and some artisans. There are also among the notables differences of wealth and property, for example, in the number of horses which they keep, for they cannot afford to keep them unless they are rich. And therefore, in old times, the cities whose strength lay in their cavalry were oligarchies, and they used cavalry in wars against their neighbors as was the practice of the Eritreans and Chalcidians, and also of the Magnesians on the river Meander, and of other peoples in Asia. Besides differences of wealth, there are differences of rank and merit, and there are some other elements which were mentioned by us when in treating of aristocracy we enumerated the essentials of a state. Of these elements, sometimes all, sometimes the lesser, and sometimes the greater number, have a share in the government. It is evident, then, that there must be many forms of government, differing in kind, since the parts of which they are composed differ from each other in kind. For a constitution is an organization of offices, which all the citizens distribute among themselves, according to the power which different classes possess, for example, the rich or the poor, or according to some principle of equality which includes both. There must therefore be as many forms of government as there are modes of arranging the offices, according to the superiorities and differences of the parts of the state. There are generally thought to be two principal forms, as men say of the winds that there are but two, north and south, and that the rest of them are only variations of these, so of governments there are said to be only two forms, democracy and oligarchy. For aristocracy is considered to be a kind of oligarchy, as being the rule of a few, and the so-called constitutional government to be really a democracy, just as among the winds we make the west a variation of the north, and the east of the south wind. Similarly, of musical modes there are said to be two kinds, the Dorian and the Phrygian. 
The other arrangements of the scale are comprehended under one or other of these two. About forms of government, this is a very favorite notion. But in either case, the better and more exact way is to distinguish, as I have done, the one or two which are true forms, and to regard the others as perversions, whether of the most perfectly attempered mode or of the best form of government. We may compare the severer and more overpowering modes to the oligarchical forms, and the more relaxed and gentler ones to the democratic. Section 4. It must not be assumed, as some are fond of saying, that democracy is simply that form of government in which the greater number are sovereign, for in oligarchies, and indeed in every government, the majority rules. Nor again is oligarchy that form of government in which a few are sovereign. Suppose the whole population of a city to be 1,300, and that of these 1,000 are rich, and do not allow the remaining three hundred, who are poor but free, and in all other respects their equals, a share of the government. No one will say that this is a democracy. In like manner, if the poor were few, and the masters of the rich who outnumber them, no one would ever call such a government, in which the rich majority have no share of office, an oligarchy. Therefore, we should rather say that democracy is the form of government in which the free are rulers, and oligarchy in which the rich. It is only an accident that the free are the many and the rich are the few. Otherwise, a government in which the offices were given according to stature, as is said to be the case in Ethiopia, or according to beauty, would be an oligarchy, for the number of tall or good-looking men is small. And yet oligarchy and democracy are not sufficiently distinguished merely by these two characteristics of wealth and freedom. Both of them contain many other elements, and therefore we must carry our analysis further and say that the government is not a democracy in which the free men, being few in number, rule over the many who are not free, as at Apollonia, on the Ionian Gulf, and at Thera. For in each of these states the nobles, who were also the earliest settlers, were held in chief honor, although they were but a few out of many. Neither is it a democracy when the rich have the government, because they exceed in number, as was the case formerly at Colophon, where the bulk of the inhabitants were possessed of large property before the Lydian war. But the form of government is a democracy when the free, who are also poor, and the majority, govern, and an oligarchy when the rich and the noble govern, they being at the same time few in number. I have said that there are many forms of government, and have explained to what causes the variety is due. Why there are more than those already mentioned, and what they are, and whence they arise, I will now proceed to consider, starting from the principle already admitted, which is that every state consists, not of one, but of many parts. If we were going to speak of the different species of animals, we should first of all determine the organs which are indispensable to every animal as for example some organs of sense and the instruments of receiving and digesting food, such as the mouth and the stomach, besides organs of locomotion. Assuming now that there are only so many kinds of organs, but that there may be differences in them, I mean different kinds of mouth and stomachs and perceptive and locomotive organs, the possible combinations of these differences will necessarily furnish many varieties of animals for animals cannot be the same which have different kinds of mouths or of ears. And when all the combinations are exhausted, there will be as many sorts of animals as there are combinations of the necessary organs. The same, then, is true of the forms of government which have been described. States, as I have repeatedly said, are composed not of one, but of many elements. One element is the food-producing class, who are called husbandmen. A second the class of mechanics, who practice the arts without which a city cannot exist. Of these arts, some are absolutely necessary, others contribute to luxury or to the grace of life. The third class is that of traders, and by traders I mean those who are engaged in buying and selling, whether in commerce or in retail trade. A fourth class is that of the serfs or laborers. The warriors make up the fifth class, and they are as necessary as any of the others, if the country is not to be the slave of every invader. For how can a state, which has any title to the name, be of a slavish nature? The state is independent and self-sufficing, but a slave is the reverse of independent. 
Hence we see that this subject, though ingeniously, has not been satisfactorily treated in the Republic. Socrates says that a state is made up of four sorts of people who are absolutely necessary. These are a weaver, a husbandman, a shoemaker, and a builder. Afterwards, finding that they are not enough, he adds a smith, and again a herdsman, to look after the necessary animals, then a merchant, and then a retail trader. All these together form the complement of the first state, as if a state were established merely to supply the necessaries of life, rather than for the sake of the good, or stood equally in need of shoemakers and of husbandmen. But he does not admit into the state a military class until the country has increased in size, and is beginning to encroach on its neighbor's land, whereupon they go to war. Yet even amongst his four original citizens, or whatever be the number of those whom he associates in the state, there must be some one who will dispense justice and determine what is just. And as the soul may be said to be more truly part of an animal than the body, so the higher parts of states, that is to say, the warrior class, the class engaged in the administration of justice, and that engaged in deliberation, which is the special business of political common sense, these are more essential to the state than the parts which minister to the necessaries of life. Whether their several functions are the functions of different citizens, or of the same, for it may often happen that the same persons are both warriors and husbandmen, is immaterial to the argument. The higher, as well as the lower elements, are to be equally considered parts of the state, and if so, the military element at any rate must be included. There are also the wealthy who minister to the state with their property. These form the seventh class. The eighth class is that of magistrates and of officers, for the state cannot exist without rulers. And therefore, some must be able to take office and to serve the state, either always or in turn. There only remains the class of those who deliberate and who judge between disputants. We were just now distinguishing them. If presence of all these elements and their fair and equitable organization is necessary to states, then there must also be persons who have the ability of statesmen. Different functions appear to be often combined in the same individual. For example, the warrior may also be a husbandman or an artisan, or again the counselor a judge, and all claim to possess political ability, and think that they are quite competent to fill most offices. But the same persons cannot be rich and poor at the same time. For this reason, the rich and the poor are regarded in an especial sense as parts of a state. Again, because the rich are generally few in number, while the poor are many, they appear to be antagonistic, and as the one or the other prevails, they form the government. Hence arises the common opinion that there are two kinds of government, democracy and oligarchy. I have already explained that there are many forms of constitution, and to what causes the variety is due. Let me now show that there are different forms both of democracy and oligarchy, as will indeed be evident from what has preceded. For both in the common people and in the notables, various classes are included. Of the common people, one class are husbandmen, another artisans, another traders who are employed in buying and selling. Another are the seafaring class, whether engaged in war or in trade, as ferrymen or as fishermen. In many places, any one of these classes forms quite a large population, for example, fishermen at Tarentum and Byzantium, crews of triremes at Athens, merchant seamen at Aegina and Caius, ferrymen at Tenedos. To the classes already mentioned may be added day laborers and those who, owing to their needy circumstances, have no leisure, or those who are not of free birth on both sides, and there may be other classes as well. The notables, again, may be divided according to their wealth, birth, virtue, education, and similar differences. Of forms of democracy, first comes that which is said to be based strictly on equality. In such a democracy, the law says that it is just for the poor to have no more advantage than the rich, and that neither should be masters but both equal. For if liberty and equality, as is thought by some, are chiefly to be found in democracy, they will be best attained when all persons alike share in the government to the utmost. 
and since the people are the majority, and the opinion of the majority is decisive, such a government must necessarily be a democracy. Here, then, is one sort of democracy. There is another, in which the magistrates are elected according to a certain property qualification, but a low one. He who has the required amount of property has a share in the government, but he who loses his property loses his rights. Another kind is that in which all the citizens who are under no disqualification share in the government, but still the law is supreme. In another, everybody, if he be only a citizen, is admitted to the government, but the law is supreme as before. A fifth form of democracy, in other respects the same, is that in which, not the law, but the multitude, have the supreme power, and supersede the law by their decrees. This is a state of affairs brought about by the demagogues, for in democracies which are subject to the law the best citizens hold the first place, and there are no demagogues. But where the laws are not supreme, there demagogues spring up, for the people becomes a monarch, and is many in one, and the many have the power in their hands, not as individuals, but collectively. Homer says that it is not good to have a rule of many, but whether he means this corporate rule, or the rule of many individuals, is uncertain. At all events, this sort of democracy, which is now a monarch, and no longer under the control of law, seeks to exercise monarchical sway, and grows into a despot. The flatterer is held in honour. This sort of democracy, being relatively to other democracies, what tyranny is to other forms of monarchy. The spirit of both is the same, and they alike exercise a despotic rule over the better citizens. The decrees of the demos correspond to the edicts of the tyrant, and the demagogue is to the one what the flatterer is to the other. Both have great power, the flatterer with the tyrant, the demagogue with democracies of the kind which we are describing. The demagogues make the decrees of the people override the laws, by referring all things to the popular assembly. And therefore they grow great, because the people have all things in their hands, and they hold in their hands the votes of the people, who are too ready to listen to them. Further, those who have any complaint to bring against the magistrates say, Let the people be judges. The people are too happy to accept the invitation, and so the authority of every office is undermined. Such democracy is fairly open to the objection that it is not a constitution at all, for where the laws have no authority there is no constitution. The law ought to be supreme over all, and the magistrates should judge of particulars, and only this should be considered a constitution. So that if democracy be a real form of government, the sort of system in which all things are regulated by decrees is clearly not even a democracy in the true sense of the word, for the decrees relate only to particulars. These, then, are the different kinds of democracy. End of Book 4, Sections 1 through 4Book 4, Sections 5 through 10 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Section 5. Of oligarchies, too, there are different kinds. One, where the property qualification for office is such that the poor, although they form the majority, have no share in the government, yet he who acquires a qualification may obtain a share. Another sort is when there is a qualification for office, but a high one, and the vacancies in the governing body are fired by co-optation. If the election is made out of all the qualified persons, a constitution of this kind inclines to an aristocracy if out of a privileged class, to an oligarchy. Another sort of oligarchy is when the son succeeds the father. There is a fourth form, likewise hereditary, in which the magistrates are supreme, and not the law. Among oligarchies, 
This is what tyranny is among monarchies, and the last mentioned form of democracy among democracies. And, in fact, this sort of oligarchy receives the name of a dynasty, or rule of powerful families. These are the different sorts of oligarchies and democracies. It should, however, be remembered that in many states the constitution which is established by law, although not democratic, owing to the education and habits of the people, may be administered democratically. And conversely, in other states the established constitution may incline to democracy, but may be administered in an oligarchical spirit. This most often happens after a revolution, for governments do not change at once. At first the dominant party are content with encroaching a little upon their opponents. The laws which existed previously continue in force, but the authors of the revolution have the power in their hands. Section 6 From what has been already said, we may safely infer that there are so many different kinds of democracies and of oligarchies. For it is evident that either all the classes whom we mentioned must share in the government, or some only and not others. When the class of husbandmen and of those who possess moderate fortunes have the supreme power, the government is administered according to law. For the citizens, being compelled to live by their labor, have no leisure, and so they set up the authority of the law, and attend assemblies only when necessary. They all obtain a share in the government when they have acquired the qualification which is fixed by the law. The absolute exclusion of any class would be a step towards oligarchy. Hence all who have acquired the property qualification are admitted to a share in the constitution. But leisure cannot be provided for them unless there are revenues to support them. This is one sort of democracy, and these are the causes which give birth to it. Another kind is based on the distinction which naturally comes next in order. In this, every one to whose birth there is no objection is eligible, but actually shares in the government only if he can find leisure. Hence, in such a democracy, the supreme power is vested in the laws, because the state has no means of paying the citizens. A third kind is when all free men have a right to share in the government, but do not actually share, for the reason which has been already given, so that in this form again the law must rule. A fourth kind of democracy is that which comes latest in the history of states. In our own day, when cities have far outgrown their original size, and their revenues have increased. All the citizens have a place in the government, through the great preponderance of the multitude, and they all, including the poor who receive pay, and therefore have leisure to exercise their rights, share in the administration. Indeed, when they are paid, the common people have the most leisure, for they are not hindered by the care of their property, which often fetters the rich, who are thereby prevented from taking part in the assembly or in the courts, and so the state is governed by the poor, who are a majority, and not by the laws. So many kinds of democracies there are, and they grow out of these necessary causes. Of oligarchies, one form is that in which the majority of the citizens have some property, but not very much, and this is the first form, which allows to any one who obtains the required amount the right of sharing in the government. The sharers in the government being a numerous body, it follows that the law must govern, and not individuals. For in proportion as they are further removed from a monarchical form of government, and in respect of property have neither so much as to be able to live without attending to business, nor so little as to need state support, they must admit the rule of law and not claim to rule themselves. But if the men of property in the state are fewer than in the former case, and own more property, there arises a second form of oligarchy. For the stronger they are, the more power they claim, and having this object in view, they themselves select those of the other classes who are to be admitted to the government. But, not being as yet strong enough to rule without the law, they make the law represent their wishes. When this power is intensified by a further diminution of their numbers and increase of their property, there arises a third and further stage of oligarchy, in which the governing class keep the offices in their own hands, and the law ordains that the son shall succeed the father. When, again, the rulers have great wealth and numerous friends, this sort of family despotism approaches a monarchy. Individuals rule and not the law. This is the fourth sort of oligarchy, and is analogous to the last sort of democracy. Section 7 
There are still two forms besides democracy and oligarchy. One of them is universally recognized and included among the four principal forms of government, which are said to be 1. Monarchy, 2. Oligarchy, 3. Democracy, and 4. The so-called aristocracy or government of the best. But there is also a fifth, which retains the generic name of polity, or constitutional government. This is not common, and therefore has not been noticed by writers who attempt to enumerate the different kinds of government. Like Plato, in their books about the state, they recognize four only. The term aristocracy is rightly applied to the form of government which is described in the first part of our treatise, for that only can be rightly called aristocracy, which is a government formed of the best men absolutely, and not merely of men who are good when tried by any given standard. In the perfect state, the good man is absolutely the same as the good citizen, whereas in other states the good citizen is only good relatively to his own form of government. But there are some states differing from oligarchies, and also differing from the so-called polity or constitutional government. These are termed aristocracies, and in them the magistrates are certainly chosen, both according to their wealth and according to their merit. Such a form of government differs from each of the two just now mentioned, and is termed an aristocracy. For indeed in states which do not make virtue the aim of the community, men of merit and reputation for virtue may be found. And so, where a government has regard to wealth, virtue, and numbers, as at Carthage, that is aristocracy, and also where it has regard only to two out of the three, as at Lacedaemon, to virtue and numbers, and the two principles of democracy and virtue temper each other. There are these two forms of aristocracy in addition to the first and perfect state, and there is a third form, viz. the constitutions which incline more than the so-called polity towards oligarchy. Section 8. I have yet to speak of the so-called polity and of tyranny. I put them in this order, not because a polity or constitutional government is to be regarded as a perversion any more than the above-mentioned aristocracies. The truth is that they all fall short of the most perfect form of government, and so they are reckoned among perversions, and the really perverted forms are perversions of these, as I said in the original discussion. Last of all, I will speak of tyranny, which I place last in the series because I am inquiring into the constitutions of states, and this is the very reverse of a constitution. Having explained why I have adopted this order, I will proceed to consider constitutional government of which the nature will be clearer, now that oligarchy and democracy have been defined. For polity, or constitutional government, may be described generally as a fusion of oligarchy and democracy, but the term is usually applied to those forms of government which incline towards democracy, and the term aristocracy to those which incline towards oligarchy, because birth and education are commonly the accompaniments of wealth. Moreover, the rich already possess the external advantages, the want of which is a temptation to crime, and hence they are called noblemen and gentlemen. And inasmuch as aristocracy seeks to give predominance to the best of the citizens, people say also of oligarchies that they are composed of noblemen and gentlemen. Now it appears to be an impossible thing that the state, which is governed not by the best citizens, but by the worst, should be well governed and equally impossible that the state which is ill-governed should be governed by the best. But we must remember that good laws, if they are not obeyed, do not constitute good government. Hence there are two parts of good government. One is the actual obedience of citizens to the laws, the other part is the goodness of the laws which they obey. They may obey bad laws as well as good. And there may be a further subdivision. They may obey either the best laws which are attainable to them, or the best absolutely. The distribution of offices according to merit is a special characteristic of aristocracy, for the principle of an aristocracy is virtue, as wealth is of an oligarchy, and freedom of a democracy. In all of them there of course exists the right of the majority, and whatever seems good to the majority of those who share in the government has authority. Now in most states the form called polity exists for the fusion goes no further than the attempt to unite the freedom of the poor and the wealth of the rich, who commonly take the place of the noble. But as there are three grounds on which men claim an equal share in the government, freedom, wealth, and virtue, 
for the fourth or good birth is the result of the two last, being only ancient wealth and virtue. It is clear that the admixture of the two elements, that is to say, of the rich and poor, is to be called a polity, or constitutional government, and the union of the three is to be called aristocracy, or the government of the best, and more than any other form of government, except the true and ideal, has a right to this name. Thus far I have shown the existence of forms of states other than monarchy, democracy, and oligarchy, and what they are, and in what aristocracies differ from one another, and polities from aristocracies. That the two latter are not very unlike is obvious. Section 9 Next we have to consider how by the side of oligarchy and democracy the so-called polity or constitutional government springs up, and how it should be organized. The nature of it will be at once understood from a comparison of oligarchy and democracy. We must ascertain their different characteristics, and taking a portion from each, put the two together like the parts of an indenture. Now there are three modes in which fusions of government may be effected. In the first mode, we must combine the laws made by both governments, say concerning the administration of justice. In oligarchies, they impose a fine on the rich if they do not serve as judges, and to the poor they give no pay. But in democracies, they give pay to the poor and do not fine the rich. Now, one, the union of these two modes is a common or middle term between them, and is therefore characteristic of constitutional government, for it is a combination of both. This is one mode of uniting the two elements. Or, two, a mean may be taken between the enactments of the two. Thus, democracies require no property qualification, or only a small one, from members of the assembly, oligarchies a high one. Here neither of these is the common term, but a mean between them. Three, there is a third mode, in which something is borrowed from the oligarchical and something from the democratical principle. For example, the appointment of magistrates by lot is thought to be democratical, and the election of them oligarchical. Democratical again when there is no property qualification, oligarchical when there is. In the aristocratical or constitutional state, one element will be taken from each, from oligarchy the principle of electing to offices, from democracy the disregard of qualification. Such are the various modes of combination. There is a true union of oligarchy and democracy when the same state may be termed either a democracy or an oligarchy. Those who use both names evidently feel that the fusion is complete. Such a fusion there is also in the mean, for both extremes appear in it. The Lacedaemonian constitution, for example, is often described as a democracy, because it has many democratical features. In the first place, the youth receive a democratical education, for the sons of the poor are brought up with the sons of the rich, who are educated in such a manner as to make it possible for the sons of the poor to be educated by them. A similar equality prevails in the following period of life, and when the citizens are grown up to manhood the same rule is observed. There is no distinction between the rich and poor. In like manner they all have the same food at their public tables, and the rich wear only such clothing as any poor man can afford. Again, the people elect to one of the two greatest offices of state, and in the other they share, for they elect the senators and share in the ephoralty. By others, the Spartan constitution is said to be an oligarchy, because it has many oligarchical elements. That all offices are filled by election and none by lot is one of these oligarchical characteristics. That the power of inflicting death or banishment rests with a few persons is another, and there are others. In a well-attempted polity, there should appear to be both elements and yet neither. Also, the government should rely on itself, and not on foreign aid, and on itself not through the goodwill of a majority. They might be equally well disposed when there is a vicious form of government, but through the general willingness of all classes in the state to maintain the constitution. Enough of the manner in which a constitutional government, and in which the so-called aristocracies, ought to be framed. Section 10. Of the nature of tyranny I have still to speak, in order that it may have its place in our inquiry, since even tyranny is reckoned by us to be a form of government, although there is not much to be said about it. 
I have already, in the former part of this treatise, discussed royalty or kingship according to the most usual meaning of the term, and considered whether it is or is not advantageous to states, and what kind of royalty should be established, and from what source, and how. When speaking of royalty, we also spoke of two forms of tyranny, which are both according to law, and therefore easily pass into royalty. Among barbarians there are elected monarchs who exercise a despotic power. Despotic rulers were also elected in ancient Hellas, called Essenides, or dictators. These monarchies, when compared with one another, exhibit certain differences, and they are, as I said before, royal, in so far as the monarch rules according to law over willing subjects, but they are tyrannical in so far as he is despotic and rules according to his own fancy. There is also a third kind of tyranny, which is the most typical form, and is the counterpart of the perfect monarchy. This tyranny is just that arbitrary power of an individual which is responsible to no one, and governs all alike, whether equals or better, with a view to its own advantage, not to that of its subjects, and therefore against their will. No freeman, if he can escape it, will endure such a government. The kinds of tyranny are such and so many, and for the reasons which I have given. End of Book 4, Sections 5 through 10「Book 4, Sections 11 through 13 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Section 11. We have now to inquire what is the best constitution for most states and the best life for most men, neither assuming a standard of virtue which is above ordinary persons, nor an education which is exceptionally favoured by nature and circumstances, nor yet an ideal state which is an aspiration only, but having regard to the life in which the majority are able to share, and to the form of government which states in general can attain. As to those aristocracies, as they are called, of which we were just now speaking, they either lie beyond the possibilities of the greater number of states, or they approximate to the so-called constitutional government, and therefore need no separate discussion. And, in fact, the conclusion at which we arrive respecting all these forms rests upon the same grounds. For if what was said in the ethics is true, that the happy life is the life according to virtue lived without impediment, and that virtue is a mean, then the life which is in a mean, and in the mean attainable by every one, must be the best. And the same principles of virtue and vice are characteristic of cities and of constitutions, for the constitution is in a figure the life of the city. Now in all states there are three elements. One class is very rich, another very poor, and a third in a mean. It is admitted that moderation and the mean are best, and therefore it will clearly be best to possess the gifts of fortune in moderation for in that condition of life men are most ready to follow rational principle. But he who greatly excels in beauty, strength, birth, or wealth, or on the other hand who is very poor, or very weak, or very much disgraced, finds it difficult to follow rational principle. Of these two, the one sort grow into violent and great criminals, the others into rogues and petty rascals, and two sorts of offences correspond to them the one committed from violence, the other from roguery. Again, the middle class is least likely to shrink from rule, or to be overambitious for it, both of which are injuries to the state. Again, those who have too much of the goods of fortune, strength, wealth, friends, and the like, are neither willing nor able to submit to authority. The evil begins at home, for when they are boys, by reason of the luxury in which they are brought up, they never learn, even at school, the habit of obedience. On the other hand, the very poor, who are in the opposite extreme, are too degraded, so that the one class cannot obey, and can only rule despotically, the other knows not how to command, and must be ruled like slaves. 
Thus arises a city, not of free men, but of masters and slaves, the one despising, the other envying. And nothing can be more fatal to friendship and good fellowship in states than this. For good fellowship springs from friendship. When men are at enmity with one another, they would rather not even share the same path. But a city ought to be composed as far as possible of equals and similars, and these are generally the middle classes. Wherefore the city which is composed of middle-class citizens is necessarily best constituted in respect of the elements of which we say the fabric of the state naturally consists. And this is the class of citizens which is most secure in a state, for they do not, like the poor, covet their neighbor's goods, nor do others covet theirs, as the poor covet the goods of the rich. And as they neither plot against others, nor are themselves plotted against, they pass through life safely. Wisely then did Phocylides pray, Many things are best in the mean. I desire to be of a middle condition in my city. Thus it is manifest that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class, and that those states are likely to be well administered in which the middle class is large and stronger, if possible, than both the other classes, or at any rate than either singly. For the addition of the middle class turns the scale, and prevents either of the extremes from being dominant. Great, then, is the good fortune of a state in which the citizens have a moderate and sufficient property. For where some possess much, and the others nothing, there may arise an extreme democracy, or a pure oligarchy. Or a tyranny may grow out of either extreme, either out of the most rampant democracy, or out of an oligarchy. But it is not so likely to arise out of the middle constitutions, and those akin to them. I will explain the reason of this hereafter, when I speak of the revolutions of states. The mean condition of states is clearly best, for no other is free from faction, and where the middle class is large, there are least likely to be factions and dissensions. For a similar reason, large states are less liable to faction than small ones, because in them the middle class is large. Whereas in small states it is easy to divide all the citizens into two classes who are either rich or poor, and to leave nothing in the middle. And democracies are safer and more permanent than oligarchies, because they have a middle class which is more numerous and has a greater share in the government. For when there is no middle class, and the poor greatly exceed in number, troubles arise, and the state soon comes to an end. A proof of the superiority of the middle class is that the best legislators have been of a middle condition. For example, Solon, as his own verses testify, and Lycurgus, for he was not a king, and Charondas, and almost all legislators. These considerations will help us to understand why most governments are either democratical or oligarchical. The reason is that the middle class is seldom numerous in them, and whichever party, whether the rich or the common people, transgresses the mean and predominates, draws the constitution its own way, and thus arises either oligarchy or democracy. There is another reason. The poor and the rich quarrel with one another, and whichever side gets the better, instead of establishing a just or popular government, regards political supremacy as the prize of victory, and the one party sets up a democracy and the other an oligarchy. Further, both the parties which had the supremacy in Hellas looked only to the interests of their own form of government, and established in states the one democracies and the other oligarchies. They thought of their own advantage, of the public not at all. For these reasons the middle form of government has rarely, if ever, existed, and among a very few only. One man alone, of all who ever ruled in Hellas, was induced to give this middle constitution to states. But it has now become a habit among the citizens of states not even to care about equality. All men are seeking for dominion, or, if conquered, are willing to submit. What then is the best form of government, and what makes it the best, is evident. And of other constitutions, since we say that there are many kinds of democracy and many of oligarchy, it is not difficult to see which has the first and which the second or any other place in the order of excellence, now that we have determined which is the best. For that which is nearest to the best must of necessity be better, and that which is furthest from it worse, if we are judging absolutely and not relatively to given conditions. 
I say, relatively to given conditions, since a particular government may be preferable, but another form may be better for some people. Section 12 We have now to consider what and what kind of government is suitable to what and what kind of man. I may begin by assuming, as a general principle common to all governments, that the portion of the state which desires the permanence of the constitution ought to be stronger than that which desires the reverse. Now every city is composed of quality and quantity. By quality I mean freedom, wealth, education, good birth, and by quantity superiority of numbers. Quality may exist in one of the classes which make up the state, and quantity in the other. For example, the meanly born may be more in number than the well-born, or the poor than the rich, yet they may not so much exceed in quantity as they fall short in quality, and therefore there must be comparison of quantity and quality. Where the number of the poor is more than proportioned to the wealth of the rich, there will naturally be a democracy, varying in form with the sort of people who compose it in each case. If, for example, the husbandmen exceed in number, the first form of democracy will then arise, if the artisans and labouring class, the last, and so with the intermediate forms. But where the rich and the notables exceed in quality more than they fall short in quantity, there oligarchy arises, similarly assuming various forms according to the kind of superiority possessed by the oligarchs. The legislator should always include the middle class in his government. If he makes his laws oligarchical, to the middle class let him look. If he makes them democratical, he should equally by his laws try to attach this class to the state. There only can the government ever be stable where the middle class exceeds one or both of the others, and in that case there will be no fear that the rich will unite with the poor against the rulers. For neither of them will ever be willing to serve the other, and if they look for some form of government more suitable to both, they will find none better than this, for the rich and the poor will never consent to rule in turn, because they mistrust one another. The arbiter is always the one trusted, and he who is in the middle is an arbiter. The more perfect the admixture of the political elements, the more lasting will be the constitution. Many even of those who desire to form aristocratical governments make a mistake, not only in giving too much power to the rich, but in attempting to overreach the people. There comes a time when out of a false good there arises a true evil, since the encroachments of the rich are more destructive to the constitution than those of the people. Section 13 The devices by which oligarchies deceive the people are five in number. They relate to 1. The assembly, 2. The magistracies, 3. The courts of law, 4. The use of arms, 5. Gymnastic exercises. 1. The assemblies are thrown open to all, but either the rich only are fined for non-attendance, or a much larger fine is inflicted upon them. 2. To the magistracies, those who are qualified by property cannot decline office upon oath, but the poor may. 3. In the law courts the rich, and the rich only, are fined if they do not serve. The poor are let off with impunity, or, as in the laws of Carondas, a larger fine is inflicted on the rich, and a smaller one on the poor. In some states all citizens who have registered themselves are allowed to attend the assembly and to try causes, but if after registration they do not attend either in the assembly or at the courts, heavy fines are imposed upon them. The intention is that through fear of the fines they may avoid registering themselves, and then they cannot sit in the law courts or in the assembly. Concerning four, the possession of arms, and five, gymnastic exercises, they legislate in a similar spirit. For the poor are not obliged to have arms, but the rich are fined for not having them. And in like manner, no penalty is inflicted on the poor for non-attendance at the gymnasium, and consequently, having nothing to fear, they do not attend, whereas the rich are liable to a fine, and therefore they take care to attend. These are the devices of oligarchical legislators and in democracies they have counter-devices. They pay the poor for attending the assemblies and the law courts, and they inflict no penalty on the rich for non-attendance. It is obvious that he who would duly mix the two principles should combine the practice of both, 
and provide that the poor should be paid to attend, and the rich fined if they do not attend, for then all will take part. If there is no such combination, power will be in the hands of one party only. The government should be confined to those who carry arms. As to the property qualification, no absolute rule can be laid down, but we must see what is the highest qualification sufficiently comprehensive to secure that the number of those who have the rights of citizens exceeds the number of those excluded. Even if they have no share in office, the poor, provided only that they are not outraged or deprived of their property, will be quiet enough. But to secure gentle treatment for the poor is not an easy thing, since the ruling class is not always humane. And in time of war the poor are apt to hesitate unless they are fed. When fed, they are willing enough to fight. In some states the government is vested not only in those who are actually serving, but also in those who have served. Among the Malians, for example, the governing body consisted of the latter, while the magistrates were chosen from those actually on service. And the earliest government which existed among the Hellenes, after the overthrow of the kingly power, grew up out of the warrior class, and was originally taken from the knights. For strength and superiority in war at that time depended on cavalry. Indeed, without discipline, infantry are useless, and in ancient times there was no military knowledge or tactics, and therefore the strength of armies lay in their cavalry. But when cities increased and the heavy armed grew in strength, more had a share in the government, and this is the reason why the states, which we call constitutional governments, have been hitherto called democracies. Ancient constitutions, as might be expected, were oligarchical and royal. Their population being small, they had no considerable middle class. The people were weak in numbers and organization, and were therefore more contented to be governed. I have explained why there are various forms of government, and why there are more than is generally supposed. For democracy, as well as other constitutions, has more than one form. Also, what their differences are, and whence they arise, and what is the best form of government, speaking generally, and to whom the various forms of government are best suited. All this has now been explained. End of Book 4, Sections 11 through 13Book 4, Sections 14 through 16 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Section 14. Having thus gained an appropriate basis of a discussion, we will proceed to speak of the points which follow next in order. We will consider the subject not only in general, but with reference to particular constitutions. All constitutions have three elements, concerning which the good lawgiver has to regard what is expedient for each constitution. When they are well ordered, the constitution is well ordered, and as they differ from one another, constitutions differ. There is one, one element which deliberates about public affairs, Secondly, two, that concerned with the magistrates, the question being what they should be, over what they should exercise authority, and what should be the mode of electing to them. And thirdly, three, that which has judicial power. The deliberative element has authority in matters of war and peace, in making and unmaking alliances. It passes laws, inflicts death, exile, confiscation, elects magistrates and audits their accounts. These powers must be assigned either all to all the citizens or all to some of them, for example, to one or more magistracies or different causes to different magistracies, or some of them to all, and others of them only to some. That all things should be decided by all is characteristic of democracy. This is the sort of equality which the people desire. But there are various ways in which all may share in the government. They may deliberate, not all in one body, but by turns, as in the constitution of Telecles the Milesian. There are other constitutions in which the boards of magistrates meet and deliberate, but come into office by turns, and are elected out of the tribes and the very smallest divisions of the state, 
until every one has obtained office in his turn. The citizens, on the other hand, are assembled only for the purposes of legislation, and to consult about the constitution, and to hear the edicts of the magistrates. In another variety of democracy, the citizens form one assembly, but meet only to elect magistrates, to pass laws, to advise about war and peace, and to make scrutinies. Other matters are referred severally to special magistrates, who are elected by vote or by lot out of all the citizens. Or again, the citizens meet about election to offices and about scrutinies, and deliberate concerning war or alliances, while other matters are administered by the magistrates, who, as far as is possible, are elected by vote. I am speaking of those magistracies in which special knowledge is required. A fourth form of democracy is when all the citizens meet to deliberate about everything, and the magistrates decide nothing, but only make the preliminary inquiries. And that is the way in which the last and worst form of democracy, corresponding as we maintain to the close family oligarchy and to tyranny, is at present administered. All these modes are democratical. On the other hand, that some should deliberate about all is oligarchical. This again is a mode which, like the democratical, has many forms. When the deliberative class being elected out of those who have a moderate qualification are numerous, and they respect and obey the prohibitions of the law without altering it, and any one who has the required qualification shares in the government, then, just because of this moderation, the oligarchy inclines towards polity. But when only selected individuals, and not the whole people, share in the deliberations of the state, then, although as in the former case they observe the law, the government is a pure oligarchy. Or again, when those who have the power of deliberation are self-elected, and son succeeds father, and they, and not the laws, are supreme, the government is of necessity oligarchical. Where, again, particular persons have authority in particular matters, for example, when the whole people decide about peace and war and hold scrutinies, but the magistrates regulate everything else, and they are elected by vote, there the government is an aristocracy. And if some questions are decided by magistrates elected by vote, and others by magistrates elected by lot, either absolutely or out of select candidates, or elected partly by vote, partly by lot, these practices are partly characteristic of an aristocratical government, and partly of a pure constitutional government. These are the various forms of the deliberative body. They correspond to the various forms of government. And the government of each state is administered according to one or other of the principles which have been laid down. Now it is for the interest of democracy, according to the most prevalent notion of it, I am speaking of that extreme form of democracy in which the people are supreme even over the laws, with a view to better deliberation, to adopt the custom of oligarchies respecting courts of law. For in oligarchies the rich who are wanted to be judges are compelled to attend under pain of a fine, whereas in democracies the poor are paid to attend. And this practice of oligarchies should be adopted by democracies in their public assemblies, for they will advise better if they all deliberate together, the people with the notables and the notables with the people. It is also a good plan that those who deliberate should be elected by vote, or by lot, in equal numbers, out of the different classes, and that if the people greatly exceed in number those who have political training, pay should not be given to all, but only to as many as would balance the number of the notables, or that the number in excess should be eliminated by lot. But in oligarchies, either certain persons should be co-opted from the mass, or a class of officers should be appointed such as exist in some states who are termed probili and guardians of the law, and the citizens should occupy themselves exclusively with matters on which these have previously deliberated. For so the people will have a share in the deliberations of the state, but will not be able to disturb the principles of the constitution. Again, in oligarchies either the people ought to accept the measures of the government, or not to pass anything contrary to them, or, if all are allowed to share in council, the decision should rest with the magistrates. The opposite of what is done in constitutional governments should be the rule in oligarchies. The veto of the majority should be final, their assent not final, but the proposal should be referred back to the magistrates. Whereas in constitutional governments they take the contrary course, the few have the negative, not the affirmative power. 
the affirmation of everything rests with the multitude. These, then, are our conclusions respecting the deliberative, that is, the supreme element in states. Section 15 Next we will proceed to consider the distribution of offices, this, too, being a part of politics concerning which many questions arise. What shall their number be? Over what shall they preside? And what shall be their duration? Sometimes they last for six months, sometimes for less. Sometimes they are annual, while in other cases offices are held for still longer periods. Shall they be for life, or for a long term of years? Or, if for a short term only, shall the same persons hold them over and over again, or once only? Also about the appointment to them. From whom are they to be chosen, and by whom, and how? We should first be in a position to say what are the possible varieties of them, and then we may proceed to determine which are suited to different forms of government. But what are to be included under the term offices? That is a question not quite so easily answered. For a political community requires many offices, and not every one who is chosen by vote or by lot is to be regarded as a ruler. In the first place there are the priests, who must be distinguished from political officers. Masters of choruses and heralds, even ambassadors, are elected by vote. Some duties of superintendents, again, are political, extending either to all the citizens in a single sphere of action, like the office of the general who superintends them when they are in the field, or to a section of them only, like the inspectorships of women or of youth. Other offices are concerned with household management, like that of the corn measurers, who exist in many states and are elected officers. There are also menial offices which the rich have executed by their slaves. Speaking generally, those are to be called offices to which the duties are assigned of deliberating about certain measures and of judging and commanding, especially the last. For to command is the especial duty of a magistrate. But the question is not of any importance in practice. No one has ever brought into court the meaning of the word, although such problems have a speculative interest. What kinds of offices, and how many, are necessary to the existence of a state, and which, if not necessary, yet conduce to its well-being, are much more important considerations, affecting all constitutions, but more especially small states. For in great states it is possible, and indeed necessary, that every office should have a special function. Where the citizens are numerous, many may hold office. And so it happens that some offices a man holds a second time only after a long interval, and others he holds once only. And certainly every work is better done which receives the soul and not the divided attention of the worker. But in small states it is necessary to combine many offices in a few hands, since the small number of citizens does not admit of many holding office. For who will there be to succeed them? And yet small states at times require the same offices and laws as large ones. The difference is that the one want them often, the others only after long intervals. Hence there is no reason why the care of many offices should not be imposed on the same person, for they will not interfere with each other. When the population is small, offices should be like the spits which also serve to hold a lamp. We must first ascertain how many magistrates are necessary in every state, and also how many are not exactly necessary, but are nevertheless useful, and then there will be no difficulty in seeing what offices can be combined in one. We should also know over which matters several local tribunals are to have jurisdiction, and in which authority should be centralized. For example, should one person keep order in the market and another in some other place, or should the same person be responsible everywhere? Again, should offices be divided according to the subjects with which they deal, or according to the persons with whom they deal? I mean to say, should one person see to good order in general, or one look after the boys, another after the women, and so on? Further, under different constitutions, should the magistrates be the same or different? For example, in democracy, oligarchy, aristocracy, monarchy, should there be the same magistrates, although they are elected, not out of equal or similar classes of citizens, but differently, under different constitutions. In aristocracies, for example, they are chosen from the educated, in oligarchies from the wealthy, and in democracies from the free. Or are there certain differences in the offices answering to them as well, 
and may the same be suitable to some, but different offices to others? For in some states it may be convenient that the same office should have a more extensive, in other states a narrower sphere. Special offices are peculiar to certain forms of government. For example, that of probuli, which is not a democratic office, although a buell or council is. There must be some body of men whose duty is to prepare measures for the people in order that they may not be diverted from their business. When these are few in number, the state inclines to an oligarchy. Or rather, the probuli must always be few, and are therefore an oligarchical element. But when both institutions exist in a state, the probuli are a check on the council. For the councillors is a democratic element, but the probuli are oligarchical. Even the power of the council disappears when democracy has taken that extreme form in which the people themselves are always meeting and deliberating about everything. This is the case when the members of the assembly receive abundant pay, for they have nothing to do and are always holding assemblies and deciding everything for themselves. A magistracy which controls the boys or the women, or any similar office, is suited to an aristocracy rather than to a democracy. For how can the magistrates prevent the wives of the poor from going out of doors? Neither is it an oligarchical office, for the wives of the oligarchs are too fine to be controlled. Enough of these matters. I will now inquire into appointments to offices. The varieties depend on three terms, and the combinations of these give all possible modes. First, who appoints? Secondly, from whom? And thirdly, how? Each of these three admits of three varieties, capital A, all the citizens, or capital B, only some, appoint. Either 1. The magistrates are chosen out of all, or 2. Out of some who are distinguished either by property qualification, or by birth, or merit, or for some special reason, as at Megara only those were eligible who had returned from exile and fought together against the democracy. They may be appointed either A. by vote, or B by lot. Again, these several varieties may be coupled. I mean that, capital C, some officers may be elected by some, others by all, and three, some again out of some, and others out of all, and C, some by vote, and others by lot. Each variety of these terms admits of four modes. For either, capital A, one A, all may appoint from all by vote, or capital A, 1 B, all from all by lot, or capital A, 2 A, all from some by vote, or capital A, 2 B, all from some by lot, and from all either by sections, as for example by tribes, and wards, and fratries, until all the citizens have been gone through, or the citizens may be in all cases eligible indiscriminately. Or again, capital A, 1 C, capital A to C, to some officers in the one way, to some in the other. Again, if it is only some that appoint, the they may do so either capital B 1 A, from all by vote, or capital B 1 B, from all by lot, or capital B 2 A, from some by vote, or capital B 2 B, from some by lot, or to some officers in the one way, to others in the other, i.e. capital B 1 C from all to some offices by vote to some by lot and capital b to capital c from some to some offices by vote to some by lot thus the modes that arise apart from two capital c three out of the three couplings number twelve of these systems two are popular that all should appoint from all capital a one a by vote or capital a one b by lot or capital A 1 C by both. That all should not appoint at once, but should appoint from all or from some, either by lot or by vote or by both, or appoint to some offices from all and to others from some, by both meaning to some offices by lot to others by vote, is characteristic of a polity. And capital B 1 C, that some should appoint from all to some offices by vote to others by lot, is also characteristic of a polity, but more oligarchical than the former method. And capital A3ABC, capital B3ABC, 
To appoint from both, to some offices from all, to others from some, is characteristic of a polity with a leaning towards aristocracy. That, capital B, too, some should appoint from some, is oligarchical, even, capital B, to B, that some should appoint from some by lot. And if this does not actually occur, it is nonetheless oligarchical in character. Or, capital B to capital C, that some should appoint from some by both. Capital B, 1A, that some should appoint from all, and capital A to A, that all should appoint from some, by vote, is aristocratic. These are the different modes of constituting magistrates, and these correspond to different forms of government. Which are proper to which, or how they ought to be established, will be evident when we determine the nature of their powers. By powers I mean such powers as a magistrate exercises of the revenue, or in defence of the country. For there are various kinds of power. The power of the general, for example, is not the same with that which regulates contracts in the market. Section 16 Of the three parts of government, the judicial remains to be considered, and this we shall divide on the same principle. There are three points on which the varieties of law courts depend. The persons from whom they are appointed, the matters with which they are concerned, and the manner of their appointment. I mean, one, are the judges taken from all, or from some only? Two, how many kinds of law courts are there? Three, are the judges chosen by vote or by lot? First, let me determine how many kinds of law courts there are. There are eight in number. One is the court of audits or scrutinies, a second takes cognizance of ordinary offences against the state, a third is concerned with treason against the constitution, the fourth determines disputes respecting penalties, whether raised by magistrates or by private persons, the fifth decides the most important civil cases, the sixth tries cases of homicide which are of various kinds, a. premeditated, b. involuntary, c. cases in which the guilt is confessed but the justice is disputed, and there may be a fourth court, d, in which murderers who have fled from justice are tried after their return, such as the court of Friato is said to be at Athens. But cases of this sort rarely happen at all, even in large cities. The different kinds of homicide may be tried either by the same or by different courts. 7. There are courts for strangers. Of these there are two subdivisions, a. for the settlement of their disputes with one another, b. for the settlement of disputes between them and the citizens. And besides all these there must be 8. Courts for small suits about sums of a drachma up to 5 drachmas, or a little more, which have to be determined but they do not require many judges. Nothing more need be said of these small suits, nor of the courts for homicide or for strangers. I would rather speak of political cases, which, when mismanaged, create division and disturbances in constitutions. Now, if all the citizens judge, in all the different cases which I have distinguished, they may be appointed by vote or by lot, or sometimes by lot and sometimes by vote. Or, when a single class of causes are tried, the judges who decide them may be appointed, some by vote and some by lot. These, then, are the four modes of appointing judges from the whole people, and there will be likewise four modes if they are elected from a part only. For they may be appointed from some by vote, and a judge in all causes, or they may be appointed from some by lot and judge in all causes, or they may be elected in some cases by vote and in some cases taken by lot, or some courts, even when judging the same causes, may be composed of members some appointed by vote and some by lot. These modes then, as was said, answer to those previously mentioned. Once more, the modes of appointment may be combined. I mean that some may be chosen out of the whole people, others out of some, some out of both. For example, the same tribunal may be composed of some who are elected out of all, and of others who are elected out of some, either by vote, or by lot, or by both. And how many forms law courts can be established has now been considered. The first form, viz. that in which the judges are taken from all the citizens, and in which all causes are tried, is democratical. The second, which is composed of a few only who try all causes, oligarchical. The third, in which some courts are taken from all classes, and some from certain classes only, aristocratical and constitutional. End of Book 4, 
Sections 14 through 16. Book 5, Sections 1 through 4 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 5, Sections 1 through 4. 1. The design which we propose to ourselves is now nearly completed. Next in order follow the causes of revolution in states, how many and of what nature they are, what modes of destruction apply to particular states, and out of what, and into what they mostly change. Also, what are the modes of preservation in states generally, or in a particular state, and by what means each state may be best preserved. These questions remain to be considered. In the first place, we must assume as our starting point that in the many forms of government which have sprung up, there has always been an acknowledgment of justice and proportionate equality, although mankind fail attaining them, as I have already explained. Democracy, for example, arises out of the notion that those who are equal in any respect are equal in all respects. Because men are equally free, they claim to be absolutely equal. Oligarchy is based on the notion that those who are unequal in one respect are in all respects unequal. Being unequal, that is, in property, they suppose themselves to be unequal absolutely. The Democrats think that as they are equal, they ought to be equal in all things, while the oligarchs, under the idea that they are unequal, claim too much, which is one form of inequality. All these forms of government have a kind of justice, but, tried by an absolute standard, they are faulty, and therefore both parties, whenever their share in the government does not accord with their preconceived ideas, stir up revolution. Those who excel in virtue have the best right of all to rebel, for they alone can with reason be deemed absolutely unequal, but then they are of all men the least inclined to do so. There is also a superiority which is claimed by men of rank, for they are thought noble because they spring from wealthy and virtuous ancestors. Here then, so to speak, are opened the very springs and fountains of revolution, and hence arise two sorts of changes in governments, the one affecting the constitution, when men seek to change from an existing form into some other, for example from democracy into oligarchy, and from oligarchy into democracy, or from either of them into constitutional government or aristocracy, and conversely, the other not affecting the constitution, when, without disturbing the form of government, whether oligarchy or monarchy or any other, they try to get the administration into their own hands. Further, there is a question of degree. An oligarchy, for example, may become more or less oligarchical, and a democracy more or less democratical and in like manner the characteristics of the other forms of government may be more or less strictly maintained. Or the revolution may be directed against a portion of the constitution only. For example, the establishment or overthrow of a particular office. As at Sparta it is said that Lysander attempted to overthrow the monarchy, and King Posenius the Ephiralty. At Epidamnus, too, the change was partial. For instead of phylarchs or heads of tribes, a council was appointed. But to this day the magistrates are the only members of the ruling class who are compelled to go to the Helii'a when an election takes place. And the office of the single archon was another oligarchical feature. Everywhere inequality is a cause of revolution, but an inequality in which there is no proportion. For instance, a perpetual monarchy among equals, and always it is the desire of equality which rises in rebellion. Now, equality is of two kinds, numerical and proportional. By the first, I mean sameness or equality in number or size. By the second, equality of ratios. For example, the excess of 3 over 2 is numerically equal to the excess of 2 over 1, whereas 4 exceeds 2 in the same ratio in which 2 exceeds 1 for two is the same part of four that one is of two, namely the half. As I was saying before, men agree that justice in the abstract is proportion, 
but they differ in that some think that if they are equal in any respect, they are equal absolutely. Others that if they are unequal in any respect, they should be unequal in all. Hence there are two principal forms of government, democracy and oligarchy, for good birth and virtue are rare, but wealth and numbers are more common. In what city shall we find a hundred persons of good birth and of virtue, whereas the rich everywhere abound? That a state should be ordered, simply and wholly, according to either kind of equality, is not a good thing. The proof is the fact that such forms of government never last. They are originally based on a mistake, and, as they begin badly, cannot fail to end badly. The inference is that both kinds of equality should be employed, numerical in some cases, and proportionate in others. Still, democracy appears to be safer and less liable to revolution than oligarchy. For in oligarchies there is the double danger of the oligarchs falling out among themselves and also with the people. But in democracies there is only the danger of a quarrel with the oligarchs. No dissension worth mentioning arises among the people themselves. And we may further remark that a government which is composed of the middle class more nearly approximates to democracy than to oligarchy, and is the safest of the imperfect forms of government. Section 2 in considering how dissensions and political revolutions arise, we must, first of all, ascertain the beginnings and causes of them which affect constitutions generally. They may said to be three in number, and we have now to give an outline of each. We want to know, one, what is the feeling, two, what are the motives of those who make them, three, whence arise political disturbances and quarrels. The universal and chief cause of this revolutionary feeling has already been mentioned, viz. the desire of equality, when men think that they are equal to others who have more than themselves, or, again, the desire of inequality and superiority, when, conceiving themselves to be superior, they think that they have not more, but the same or less than their inferiors, pretensions which may and may not be just. Inferiors revolt in order that they may be equal, and equals that they may be superior. Such is the state of mind which creates revolutions. The motives for making them are the desire of gain and honor, or the fear of dishonor and loss. The authors of them want to divert punishment or dishonor from themselves or their friends. The causes and reasons of revolutions, whereby men are themselves affected in the way described, and about the things which I have mentioned, viewed in one way may be regarded as seven, and in another as more than seven. Two of them have already been noticed, but they act in a different manner, for men are excited against one another by the love of gain and honor, not, as in the case which I have just supposed, in order to obtain them for themselves, but at seeing others, justly or unjustly, engrossing them. Other causes are insolence, fear, excessive predominance, contempt, disproportionate increase in some part of the state. Causes of another sort are election intrigues, carelessness, neglect about trifles, dissimilarity of elements. Section 3. What share insolence and avarice have in creating revolutions, and how they work, is plain enough. When the magistrates are insolent and grasping, they conspire against one another, and also against the constitution from which they derive their power, making their gains either at the expense of individuals or of the public. It is evident, again, what an influence honor exerts, and how it is a cause of revolution. Men who are themselves dishonored, and who see others obtaining honors, rise in rebellion. The honor or dishonor when undeserved is unjust, and just when awarded according to merit. Again, superiority is a cause of revolution, when one or more persons have a power which is too much for the state and the power of the government. This is a condition of affairs out of which there arises a monarchy, or a family oligarchy. And therefore, in some places, as at Athens and Argos, they have recourse to ostracism. But how much better to provide from the first, that there should be no such preeminent individuals, instead of letting them come into existence, and then finding a remedy? Another cause of revolution is fear. Either men have committed wrong, and are afraid of punishment, or they are expecting to suffer wrong, and are desirous of anticipating their enemy. Thus at Rhodes the notables conspired against the people, through fear of the suits that were brought against them. 
Contempt is also a cause of insurrection and revolution. For example, in oligarchies, when those who have no share in the state are the majority, they revolt, because they think that they are the stronger. Or again, in democracies, the rich despise the disorder and anarchy of the state. At Thebes, for example, where, after the Battle of Enophida, the bad administration of the democracy led to its ruin. At Megara, the fall of the democracy was due to a defeat, occasioned by disorder and anarchy. And at Syracuse, the democracy aroused contempt before the tyranny of Gelo arose, at Rhodes before the insurrection. Political revolutions also spring from a disproportionate increase in any part of the state. For, as a body is made up of many members, and every member ought to grow in proportion, that symmetry may be preserved, but loses its nature if the foot be four cubits long, and the rest of the body two spans. And, should the abnormal increase be one of quality as well as of quantity, may even take the form of another animal. Even so, a state has many parts, of which some one may often grow imperceptibly. For example, the number of poor in democracies and in constitutional states. And this disproportion may sometimes happen by an accident, as at Tarentum, from a defeat in which many of the notables were slain in a battle with the Iapygians, just after the Persian War, the constitutional government in consequence becoming a democracy. Or, as was the case at Argos, where the Argives, after their army had been cut to pieces on the seventh day of the month by Cleomenes, the Lacedaemonian, were compelled to admit to citizen some of their Periisai, and at Athens, when, after frequent debates of their infantry, at the time of the Peloponnesian War, the notables were reduced in number, because the soldiers had to be taken from the role of citizens. Revolutions arise from this cause as well, in democracies as in other forms of government, but not to so great an extent. When the rich grow numerous, or properties increase, the form of government changes into an oligarchy, or a government of families. Forms of government also change, sometimes even without revolution, owing to election contests, as at Horea, where instead of electing their magistrates, they took them by lot, because the electors were in the habit of choosing their own partisans. Or owing to carelessness, when disloyal persons are allowed to find their way into the highest offices, as at Oreum, where upon the accession of Heracleodorus to office, the oligarchy was overthrown, and changed by him into a constitutional and democratical government. Again, the revolution may be facilitated by the slightness of the change. I mean that a great change may sometimes slip into the constitution through neglect of a small matter. At Embracia, for instance, the qualification for office, small at first, was eventually reduced to nothing. For the Embraciots thought that a small qualification was much the same as none at all. Another cause of revolution is difference of races, which do not at once acquire a common spirit. For a state is not the growth of a day, any more than it grows out of a multitude brought together by accident. Hence the reception of strangers and colonies, either at the time of their foundation or afterwards, has generally produced revolution. For example, the Achaeans who joined the Trezenians in the foundation of Sybaris, becoming later the more numerous, expelled them. Hence the curse fell upon Sybaris. At Thurii, the Sybarites quarreled with their fellow colonists, thinking that the land belonged to them. They wanted too much of it and were driven out. At Byzantium, the new colonists were detected in a conspiracy, and were expelled by force of arms. The people of Antissa, who had received the Chian exiles, fought with them and drove them out. And the Zancleans, after having received the Samians, were driven by them out of their own city. The citizens of Apollonia on the Euxine, after the introduction of a fresh body of colonists, had a revolution. The Syracusans, after the expulsion of their tyrants, having admitted strangers and mercenaries to the rights of citizenship, quarreled and came to blows. The people of Amphipolis, having received Chalcidian colonists, were nearly all expelled by them. Now in oligarchies, the masses make revolution under the idea that they are unjustly treated, because, as I said before, they are equals, and have not an equal share. And in democracies, the notables revolt, because they are not equals, and yet have only an equal share. Again, the situation of cities is a cause of revolution, when the country is not naturally adapted to preserve the unity of the state. For example, the Chitians at Clazamene did not agree with the people of the island, and the people of Colophon quarreled with the Notians. 
At Athens, too, the inhabitants of the Piraeus are more democratic than those who live in the city. For just as in war the impediment of a ditch, though ever so small, may break a regiment, so every cause of difference, however slight, makes a breach in a city. The greatest opposition is confessedly that of virtue and vice. Next comes that of wealth and poverty, and there are other antagonistic elements, greater or less, of which one is the difference of place. Section 4 In revolutions the occasions may be trifling, but great interests are at stake. Even trifles are most important when they concern the rulers, as was the case of old at Syracuse, for the Syracusan constitution was once changed by a love quarrel of two young men who were in the government. The story is that while one of them was away from home, his beloved was gained over by his companion, and he, to revenge himself, seduced the other's wife. They then drew ruling class into their quarrel, and so split all the people into portions. We learn from this story that we should be on our guard against the beginnings of such evils, and should put an end to the quarrels of chiefs and mighty men. The mistake lies in the beginning, as the proverb says, well begun is half done. So an error at the beginning, though quite small, bears the same ratio to the errors in the other parts. In general, when the notables quarrel, the whole city is involved, as happened in Hesdia after the Persian War. The occasion was the division of an inheritance. One of two brothers refused to give an account of their father's property and the treasure which he had found. So the poorer of the two quarreled with him and enlisted in his cause the popular party. The other, who was very rich, the wealthy classes. At Delphi, again, a quarrel about a marriage was the beginning of all the troubles which followed. In this case the bridegroom, fancying some occurrence to be of evil omen, came to the bride and went away without taking her. Whereupon her relations, thinking that they were insulted by him, put some of the sacred treasure among his offerings while he was sacrificing, and then slew him, pretending that he had been robbing the temple. At Mytilene, too, a dispute about heiresses was the beginning of many misfortunes, and led to the war with the Athenians, in which Pachys took their city. A wealthy citizen named Timophanes left two daughters. Dexander, another citizen, wanted to obtain them for his sons, but he was rejected in a suit, whereupon he stirred up a revolution, and instigated the Athenians, of whom he was Proxenus, to interfere. A similar quarrel about an heiress arose at Phocis, between Nasius, the father of Nason, and Euthycrates, the father of Onomarchus. This was the beginning of the sacred war. A marriage quarrel was also the cause of a change in the government of Epidamnus. A certain man betrothed his daughter to a person whose father, having been made a magistrate, fined the father of the girl, and the latter, stung by the insult, conspired with unenfranchised classes to overthrow the state. Governments also change into oligarchy or into democracy, or into a constitutional government, because the magistrates, or some other section of the state, increase in power or renown. Thus at Athens, the reputation gained by the court of the Areopagus, in the Persian War, seemed to tighten the reins of government. On the other hand, the victory of Salamis, which was gained by the common people who served in the fleet, and won for the Athenians the empire due to the command of the sea, strengthened the democracy. At Argos, the notables, having distinguished themselves against the Lacedaemonians in the Battle of Mantinea, attempted to put down the democracy. At Syracuse, the people, having been the chief authors of the victory in the war with the Athenians, changed the constitutional government into democracy. At Chalcis, the people, uniting with the notables, killed Phoxus the tyrant, and then seized the government. At Ambracia, the people, in like manner, having joined with the conspirators in expelling the tyrant Periander, transferred the government to themselves. And generally it should be remembered that those who have secured power to the state, whether private citizens or magistrates or tribes, or any other part or section of the state, are apt to cause revolutions. For either envy of their greatness draws others into rebellion, or they themselves, in their pride of superiority, are unwilling to remain on a level with others. Revolutions also break out when opposite parties, for example the rich and the people, are equally balanced, and there is little or no middle class. For if either party were manifestly superior, the other would not risk an attack upon them. And, for this reason, those who are eminent in virtue usually do not stir up insurrections, always being a minority. 
such are the beginnings and causes of the disturbances and revolutions to which every form of government is liable. Revolutions are effected in two ways, by force and by fraud. Force may be applied either at the time of making the revolution or afterwards. Fraud, again, is of two kinds. For one, sometimes the citizens are deceived into acquiescing in a change of government, and afterwards they are held in subjection against their will. This was what happened in the case of the four hundred, who deceived the people by telling them that the king would provide money for the war against the Lacedaemonians, and, having cheated the people, still endeavored to retain the government. 2. In other cases, the people are persuaded at first, and afterwards, by a repetition of the persuasion, their goodwill and allegiance are retained. The revolutions which affect constitutions generally spring from the above-mentioned causes. End of Book 5, Sections 1 through 4 Book 5, Sections 5 through 7 of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 5, Sections 5 through 7. 5. And now, taking each constitution separately, we must see what follows from the principles already laid down. Revolutions in democracies are generally caused by the intemperance of demagogues, who either in their private capacity lay information against rich men until they compel them to combine, for a common danger unites even the bitterest enemies, or coming forward in public stir up the people against them. The truth of this remark is proved by a variety of examples. At cost, the democracy was overthrown because wicked demagogues arose and the notables combined. At Rhodes, the demagogues not only provided pay for the multitude, but prevented them from making good to the triarchs the sums which had been expended by them, and they, in consequence of the suits which were brought against them, were compelled to combine and put down the democracy. The democracy at Heraclea was overthrown shortly after the foundation of the colony by the injustice of the demagogues, which drove out the notables, who came back in a body and put an end to the democracy. Much in the same manner, the democracy at Megara was overturned. There the demagogues drove out many of the notables, in order that they might be able to confiscate their property. At length the exiles, becoming numerous, returned, and, engaging in defeating the people, established the oligarchy. The same thing happened with the democracy of Saimi, which was overthrown by Thrasymachus. And we may observe that in most states the changes have been of this character. For sometimes the demagogues, in order to curry favor with the people, wrong the notables, and so force them to combine. Either they make a division of their property, or diminish their incomes by the imposition of public services. And sometimes they bring accusations against the rich, that they may have their wealth to confiscate. Of old, the demagogue was also a general, and then democracies changed into tyrannies. Most of the ancient tyrants were originally demagogues. They are not so now, but they were then, and the reason is that they were generals and not orators, for oratory had not yet come into fashion. Whereas in our day, when the art of rhetoric has made such progress, the orators lead the people, but their ignorance of military matters prevents them from usurping power. At any rate, instances to the contrary are few and slight. Tyrannies were more common formerly than now, for this reason also, that great power was placed in the hands of individuals. Thus a tyranny arose at Miletus out of the office of the Pritonus, who had supreme authority in many important matters. Moreover, in those days, when cities were not large, the people dwelt in the fields, busy at their work, and their chiefs, if they possessed any military talent, seized the opportunity, and, winning the confidence of the masses by professing their hatred of the wealthy, they succeeded in obtaining the tyranny. Thus at Athens, Pisistratus led a faction against the men of the plain, and Theagenes at Megara slaughtered the cattle of the wealthy, which he had found by the riverside, where they had put them to graze in land not their own. Dionysius, again, was thought worthy of the tyranny, because he denounced Daphnius and the rich, 
his enmity to the notables won for him the confidence of the people. Changes also take place from the ancient to the latest form of democracy, for where there is a popular election of the magistrates, and no property qualification, the aspirants for office get hold of the people, and contrive at last even to set them above the laws. A more or less complete cure for this state of things is for the separate tribes, and not the whole people, to elect the magistrates. These are the principal causes of revolutions in democracies. 6. There are two patent causes of revolutions in oligarchies. 1. First, when the oligarchs oppress the people, for then anybody is good enough to be their champion, especially if he be himself a member of the oligarchy, as Ligdemus at Naxos, who afterwards came to be tyrant. But revolutions which commence outside the governing class may be further subdivided. Sometimes, when the government is very exclusive, the revolution is brought about by persons of the wealthy class who were excluded, as happened at Massalia and Istros and Heraclea and other cities. Those who had no share in the government created a disturbance, until first the elder brothers and then the younger were admitted, for in some places father and son, in others elder and younger brothers, do not hold office together. At Massalia the oligarchy became more like a constitutional government, but at Istros ended in a democracy, and at Heraclea was enlarged to six hundred. At Nidos, again, the oligarchy underwent a considerable change, for the notables fell out among themselves, because only a few shared in the government. There existed among them the rule already mentioned, that father and son not hold office together, and if there were several brothers, only the eldest was admitted. The people took advantage of the quarrel, and, choosing one of the notables to be their leader, attacked and conquered the oligarchs, who were divided, and division is always a source of weakness. The city of Erythrae, too, in old times was ruled, and ruled well, by the Basilidae, but the people took offense at the narrowness of the oligarchy and changed the constitution. 2. Of internal causes of revolutions in oligarchies, one is the personal rivalry of the oligarchs, which leads them to play the demagogue. Now the oligarchical demagogue is of two sorts. Either a. He practices upon the oligarchs themselves, for although the oligarchy are quite a small number, there may be a demagogue among them, as at Athens, Caracles's party won power by courting the thirty, that of Phrenicus by courting the four hundred. Or b. The oligarchs may play the demagogue with the people. This was the case at Larissa, where the guardians of the citizens endeavored to gain over the people because they were elected by them, and such is the fate of all oligarchies in which the magistrates are elected, as at Abidus, not by the class to which they belong, but by the heavy armed or by the people, although they may be required to have a high qualification, or to be members of a political club. Or, again, where the law courts are composed of persons outside the government, the oligarchs flatter the people in order to obtain a decision in their own favor, and so they change the constitution. This happened at Heraclea in Pontus. Again, oligarchies change whenever any attempt is made to narrow them, for then those who desire equal rights are compelled to call in the people. Changes in the oligarchy also occur when the oligarchs waste their private property by extravagant living, for then they want to innovate, and either try to make themselves tyrants, or install someone else in the tyranny, as Hipparinus did Dionysius at Syracuse, and as at Amphipolis a man named Cleotimus introduced Chalcidian colonists, and when they arrived stirred them up against the rich. For a like reason, in Aegina, the person who carried on the negotiation with Chares endeavored to revolutionize the state. Sometimes a party among the oligarchs tried directly to create a political change. Sometimes they robbed the treasury, and then either the thieves, or, as happened at Apollonia and Pontus, those who resist them in their thieving, quarrel with the rulers. But an oligarchy which is at unity with itself is not easily destroyed from within, of this we may see an example at Pharsalus, for there, although the rulers are few in number, they govern a large city, because they have a good understanding among themselves. Oligarchies, again, are overthrown when another oligarchy is created within the original one, that is to say, 
when the whole governing body is small, and yet they do not all share in the highest offices. Thus at Elis, the governing body was a small senate, and very few ever found their way into it, because the senators were only ninety in number, and were elected for life, and out of certain families, in a manner similar to the Lacedaemonian elders. Oligarchy is liable to revolutions, alike in war and in peace. In war because, not being able to trust the people, the oligarchs are compelled to hire mercenaries, and the general who is in command of them often ends in becoming a tyrant, as Timophanes did at Corinth. Or, if there are more generals than one, they make themselves into a company of tyrants. Sometimes the oligarchs, fearing this danger, give the people a share in the government because their services are necessary to them. And in time of peace, from mutual distrust, the two parties hand over the defense of the state to the army and to an arbiter between the two factions, who often ends the master of both. This happened at Larissa, when Simos the Aluet had the government, and at Abidus in the days of Ephiades in the political clubs. Revolutions also arise out of marriages or lawsuits which lead to the overthrow of one party among the oligarchs by another. Of quarrels about marriages, I have already mentioned some instances. Another occurred at Eritrea, where Diagoras overturned the oligarchy of the knights because he had been wronged about a marriage. A revolution at Heraclea and another at Thebes both arose out of decisions of law courts upon a charge of adultery. In both cases the punishment was just, but executed in the spirit of party at Heraclea upon Eurytion and at Thebes upon Archias. For their enemies were jealous of them, and so had them pilloried in the Agora. Many oligarchies have been destroyed by some members of the ruling class taking offense at their excessive despotism. For example, the oligarchy at Nidus and at Caius. Changes of constitutional governments, and also of oligarchies which limit the office of counselor, judge, or other magistrate to persons having a certain money qualification, often occur by accident. The qualification may have been originally fixed, according to the circumstances of the time, in such a manner as to include in an oligarchy a few only, or in a constitutional government the middle class. But after a time of prosperity, whether arising from peace or some other good fortune, the same property becomes many times as valuable, and then everybody participates in every office. This happens sometimes gradually and insensibly, and sometimes quickly. These are the causes of changes and revolutions in oligarchies. We must remark generally, both of democracies and oligarchies, that they sometimes change, not into the opposite forms of government, but only into another variety of the same class. I mean to say, from those forms of democracy and oligarchy which are regulated by law, into those which are arbitrary, and conversely. 7. In aristocracies, Revolutions are stirred up when a few only share in the honors of the state, a cause which has already been shown to affect oligarchies. For an aristocracy is a sort of oligarchy, and, like an oligarchy, is the government of a few, although few not for the same reason, hence the two are often confounded. And revolutions will be most likely to happen, and must happen, when the mass of the people are of the high-spirited kind and have a notion that they are as good as their rulers. Thus at Lacedaemon, the so-called Parthenii, who were the illegitimate sons of the Spartan peers, attempted a revolution, and, being detected, were sent away to colonize Tarentum. Again, revolutions occur when great men, who are at least of equal merit, are dishonored by those higher in office, as Lysander was by the kings of Sparta, or when a brave man is excluded from the honors of the state like Synodon, who conspired against the Spartans in the reign of Agesilaus, or, again, when some are very poor and others very rich, a state of society which is most often the result of war, as at Lacedaemon in the days of the Mycenaean War. This is proved from the poem of Tertius, entitled Good Order, for he speaks of certain citizens who were ruined by the war and wanted to have a redistribution of the land. Again, revolutions arise when an individual who is great, and might be greater, wants to rule alone, as at Lacedaemon, Pausanias, who was general in the Persian War, or like Hanno at Carthage. 
constitutional governments and aristocracies are commonly overthrown owing to some deviation from justice in the constitution itself. The cause of the downfall is, in the former, the ill-mingling of the two elements, democracy and oligarchy. In the latter of the three elements, democracy, oligarchy, and virtue, but especially democracy and oligarchy. For to combine these is the endeavor of constitutional governments, and most of the so-called aristocracies have a like aim but differ from polities in the mode of combination. Hence some of them are more, and some less permanent. Those which incline more to oligarchy are called aristocracies, and those which incline to democracy constitutional governments. And therefore the latter are the safer of the two, for the greater the number, the greater the strength, and when men are equal they are contented. But the rich, if the constitution gives them power, are apt to be insolent and avaricious, and, in general, whichever way the Constitution inclines, in that direction it changes, as either party gains strength. A constitutional government becoming a democracy, an aristocracy, an oligarchy. But the process may be reversed, and aristocracy may change into democracy. This happens when the poor, under the idea that they are being wronged, force the Constitution to take an opposite form. In like manner, constitutional governments change into oligarchies. The only stable principle of government is equality according to proportion, and for every man to enjoy his own. What I have just mentioned actually happened at Theriae, where the qualification for office, at first high, was therefore reduced, and the magistrates increased in number. The notables had previously acquired the whole of the land contrary to law, for the government tended to oligarchy, and they were able to encroach. But the people, who had been trained by war, soon got the better of the guards kept by the oligarchs, until those who had had too much gave up their land. Again, since all aristocratical governments incline to oligarchy, the notables are apt to be grasping. Thus at Lacedaemon, where property tends to pass into few hands, the notables can do too much as they like, and are allowed to marry whom they please. The city of Locri was ruined by a marriage connection with Dionysius, but such a thing could never have happened in a democracy, or in a well-balanced aristocracy. I have already remarked that in all states revolutions are occasioned by trifles. In aristocracies, above all, they are of a gradual and imperceptible nature. The citizens begin by giving up some part of the constitution, and so with greater ease the government change something else, which is a little more important, until they have undermined the whole fabric of the state. At Thurii, there was a law that generals should only be re-elected after an interval of five years, and some young men, who were popular with the soldiers of the guard for their military prowess, despising the magistrates, and thinking that they would easily gain their purpose, wanted to abolish this law, and allow their generals to hold perpetual commands, for they well knew that the people would be glad enough to elect them. Whereupon the magistrates, who had charge of these matters, and who are called counsellors, at first determined to resist, but they afterwards consented, thinking that, if only this one law was changed, no further inroad would be made on the Constitution. But other changes soon followed, which they in vain attempted to oppose, and the state passed into the hands of the revolutionists, who established a dynastic oligarchy. All constitutions are overthrown either from within or from without the latter when there is some government close at hand having an opposite interest, or at a distance but powerful. This was exemplified in the old times of the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians. The Athenians everywhere put down the oligarchies, and the Lacedaemonians the democracies. I have now explained what are the chief causes of revolutions and dissensions in states. End of Book 5, Sections 5-7 through seven. Book Five, Sections Eight through Nine of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Sections Eight through Nine. Eight. We have next to consider 
what means there are of preserving constitutions in general and in particular cases. In the first place, it is evident that if we know the causes which destroy constitutions, we also know the causes which preserve them, for opposites produce opposites, and destruction is the opposite of preservation. In all well-attempered governments, there is nothing which should be more jealously maintained than the spirit of obedience to the law, more especially in small matters, for transgression creeps in unperceived and at last ruins the state, just as the constant recurrence of small expenses in time eats up a fortune. The expense does not take place at once, and therefore is not observed. The mind is deceived, as in the fallacy which says that if each part is little, then the whole is little. This is true in one way, but not in another, for the whole and the all are not little, although they are made up of littles. In the first place, then, men should guard against the beginning of change, and in the second place, they should not rely upon the political devices of which I have already spoken, invented only to deceive the people, for they are proved by experience to be useless. Further, we note that oligarchies, as well as aristocracies, may last, not from any inherent stability in such forms of government, but because the rulers are on good terms, both with the unenfranchised and with the governing classes, not maltreating any who are excluded from the government, but introducing into it the leading spirits among them. They should never wrong the ambitious in a matter of honor, or the common people in a matter of money and they should treat one another and their fellow-citizen in a spirit of equality. The equality which the friends of democracy seek to establish for the multitude is not only just, but likewise expedient among equals. Hence, if the governing class are numerous, many democratic institutions are useful. For example, the restriction of the tenure of offices to six months, that all those who are of equal rank may share in them. Indeed, equals or peers, when they are numerous, become a kind of democracy, and therefore demagogues are very likely to arise among them, as I have already remarked. The short tenure of office prevents oligarchies and aristocracies from falling into the hands of families. It is not easy for a person to do any great harm when his tenure of office is short, whereas long possession begets tyranny in oligarchies and democracies for the aspirants to tyranny are either the principal men of the state, who in democracies are demagogues, and in oligarchies members of ruling houses, or those who hold great offices, and have a long tenure of them. Constitutions are preserved when their destroyers are at a distance, and sometimes also because they are near, for the fear of them makes the government keep in hand the constitution. Wherefore, the ruler who has a care of the Constitution should invent terrors, and bring distant dangers near, in order that the citizens may be on their guard, and, like sentinels in a night watch, never relax their attention. He should endeavor to, by help of the laws, to control the contentions and quarrels of the notables, and to prevent those who have not hitherto taken part in them from catching the spirit of contention. No ordinary man can discern the beginning of evil, but only the true statesman. As to the change produced in oligarchies and constitutional governments, by the alteration of the qualification, when this arises not out of any variation in the qualification, but only out of the increase of money, it is well to compare the general valuation of property with that of past years, annually in those cities in which the census is taken annually, and in larger cities every third or fifth year. If the whole is many times greater, or many times less, than when the ratings recognized by the Constitution were fixed, there should be power given by law to raise or lower the qualification as the amount is greater or less. Where this is not done, a constitutional government passes into an oligarchy, and an oligarchy is narrowed to a rule of families, or in the opposite case, constitutional government becomes democracy, and oligarchy either constitutional government or democracy. It is a principle common to democracy, oligarchy, and every other form of government, not to allow the disproportionate increase of any citizen, but to give moderate honor for a long time, rather than great honor for a short time. For men are easily spoiled, not every one can bear prosperity. But if this rule is not observed, at any rate the honors which are given all at once should be taken away by degrees and not all at once especially should the laws provide against anyone having too much power, 
whether derived from friends or money. If he has, he should be sent clean out of the country. And since innovations creep in through the private life of individuals also, there ought to be a magistracy which will have an eye to those whose life is not in harmony with the government, whether oligarchy or democracy or any other. And for a like reason, an increase in prosperity in any part of the state should be carefully watched. The proper remedy for this evil is always to give the management of affairs and offices of state to opposite elements. Such opposites are the virtuous and the many, or the rich and the poor. Another way is to combine the poor and the rich in one body, or to increase the middle class. Thus an end will be put to the revolutions which arise from inequality. But above all, every state should be so administered, and so regulated by law, that its magistrates cannot possibly make money. In oligarchies, special precautions should be used against this evil. For the people do not take any great offense at being kept out of the government. Indeed, they are rather pleased than otherwise at having leisure for their private business. But what irritates them is to think that their rulers are stealing the public money. Then they are doubly annoyed, for they lose both honor and profit. If office brought no profit, then and then only could democracy and aristocracy be combined, for both notables and people might have their wishes gratified. All would be able to hold office, which is the aim of democracy, and the notables would be magistrates, which is the aim of aristocracy. And this result may be accomplished when there is no possibility of making money out of the offices, for the poor will not want to have them when there is nothing to be gained from them, they would rather be attending to their own concerns, and the rich, who do not want money from the public treasury, will be able to take them, and so the poor will keep to their work and grow rich, and the notables will not be governed by the lower class. In order to avoid peculation of the public money, the transfer of the revenue should be made at a general assembly of the citizens, and duplicates of the accounts deposited with the different brotherhoods, companies, and tribes. An honor should be given by law to magistrates who have the reputation of being incorruptible. In democracies, the rich should be spared. Not only should their property not be divided, but their incomes also, which in some states are taken from them imperceptibly, should be protected. It is a good thing to prevent the wealthy citizens, even if they are willing, from undertaking expensive and useless public services, such as the giving of choruses, torch races, and the like. In an oligarchy, on the other hand, great care should be taken of the poor, and lucrative offices should go to them. If any of the wealthy classes insult them, the offender should be punished more severely than if he had wronged one of his own class. Provision should be made that the estates pass by inheritance and not by gift, and no person should have more than one inheritance, for in this way properties will be equalized, and more of the poor rise to competency. It is also expedient, both in a democracy and in an oligarchy, to assign to those who have less share in the government, i.e. to the rich in a democracy and to the poor in an oligarchy, an equality or preference in all but the principal offices of state. The latter should be entrusted chiefly or only to members of the governing class. 9. There are three qualifications required in those who have to fill the highest offices. 1. First of all, loyalty to the established constitution. 2. The greatest administrative capacity. 3. Virtue and justice of the kind proper to each form of government. For, if what is just is not the same in all governments, the quality of justice must also differ. There may be a doubt, however, when all these qualities do not meet in the same person, how the selection is to be made. Suppose, for example, a good general is a bad man and not a friend to the Constitution, and another man is loyal and just. Which should we choose? In making the election, ought we not to consider two points, what qualities are common and what are rare? Thus, in the choice of a general, we should regard his skill rather than his virtue, for few have military skill, but many have virtue. In any office of trust or stewardship, on the other hand, the opposite rule should be observed, for more virtue than ordinary is required in the holder of such an office, but the necessary knowledge is of a sort which all men possess. It may, however, be asked, what a man wants with virtue, if he have political ability and is loyal, since these two qualities alone will make him do what is for the public interest. 
But may not men have both of them, and yet be deficient in self-control? If, knowing and loving their own interests, they do not always attend to them, may they not be equally negligent of the interests of the public? Speaking generally, we may say that, whatever legal enactments are held to be for the interest of various constitutions, all these preserve them. And the great preserving principle is the one which has been repeatedly mentioned, to have a care that the loyal citizen should be stronger than the disloyal. Neither should we forget the mean, which at the present day is lost sight of in perverted forms of government, for many practices which appear to be democratical are the ruin of democracies, and many which appear to be oligarchical are the ruin of oligarchies. Those who think that all virtue is to be found in their own party principles push matters to extremes. They do not consider that disproportion destroys a state. A nose, which varies from the ideal of straightness to a hook or snub, may still be of good shape and agreeable to the eye, but if the excess be very great, all symmetry is lost, and the nose at last ceases to be a nose at all on account of some excess in one direction or defect in the other, and this is true of every other part of the human body. The same law of proportion equally holds in states. Oligarchy or democracy, although a departure from the most perfect form, may yet be a good enough government, but if any one attempts to push the principles of either to an extreme, he will begin by spoiling the government, and end by having none at all. Wherefore the legislator and the statesman ought to know what democratical measures save and what destroy a democracy, and what oligarchical measures save or destroy an oligarchy. For neither the one nor the other can exist or continue to exist unless both rich and poor are included in it. If equality of property is introduced, the state must of necessity take another form, for when by laws carried to excess one or other element in the state is ruined, the constitution is ruined. There is an error common both to oligarchies and to democracies. In the latter, the demagogues, when the multitude are above the law, are always cutting the city in two by quarrels with the rich, whereas they should always profess to be maintaining their cause, just as in oligarchies the oligarch should profess to maintaining the cause of the people, and should take oaths the opposite of those which they now take. For there are cities in which they swear, I will be an enemy to the people, and will devise all the harm against them which I can. But they ought to exhibit, and to entertain, the very opposite feeling. In the form of their oath there should be an express declaration, I will do no wrong to the people. But of all the things which I have mentioned, that which most contributes to the permanence of constitutions is the adaptation of education to the form of government, and yet in our own day this principle is universally neglected. The best laws, though sanctioned by every citizen of the state, will be of no avail unless the young are trained by habit and education in the spirit of the constitution. If the laws are democratical, democratically, or oligarchically, if the laws are oligarchical. For there may be a want of self-discipline in states as well as in individuals. Now, to have been educated in the spirit of the Constitution is not to perform the actions in which oligarchs or democrats delight, but those by which the existence of an oligarchy or of a democracy is made possible. Whereas among ourselves, the sons of the ruling class in an oligarchy live in luxury, but the sons of the poor are hardened by exercise and toil, and hence they are both more inclined and better able to make a revolution. And in democracies of the more extreme type, there has arisen a false idea of freedom which is contradictory to the true interests of the state. For two principles are characteristic of democracy, the government of the majority and freedom. Men think that what is just is equal, and that equality is the supremacy of the popular will and that freedom means the doing what a man likes. In such democracies, everyone lives as he pleases, or in the words of Euripides, according to his fancy. But this is all wrong. Men should not think it slavery to live according to the rule of the Constitution, for it is their salvation. I have now discussed generally the causes of the revolution and destruction of states, and the means of their preservation and continuance. End of Book 5, Sections 8 through 9
Book Five, Section Ten of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Section Ten. I have still to speak of monarchy, and the causes of its destruction and preservation. What I have said already, respecting forms of constitutional government, applies almost equally to royal and to tyrannical rule. For royal rule is of the nature of an aristocracy, and a tyranny is a compound of oligarchy and democracy in their most extreme forms. It is, therefore, most injurious to its subjects, being made up of two evil forms of government, and having the perversions and errors of both. These two forms of monarchy are contrary in their very origin. The appointment of a king is the resource of the better classes against the people, and he is elected by them out of their own number, because either he himself or his family excel in virtue and virtuous actions, whereas a tyrant is chosen from the people to be their protector against the notables, and in order to prevent them from being injured. History shows that almost all tyrants have been demagogues who gain the favor of the people by their accusation of the notables. At any rate, this was the manner in which the tyrannies arose in the days when cities had increased in power. Others, which were older, originated in the ambition of kings, wanting to overstep the limits of their hereditary power and become despots. Others, again, grew out of the class which were chosen to be chief magistrates, for in ancient times the people who elected them gave the magistrates, whether civil or religious, a long tenure. Others arose out of the custom which oligarchies had of making some individual supreme over the highest offices. In any of these ways, an ambitious man had no difficulty, if he desired, in creating a tyranny, since he had the power in his hands already, either as king or as one of the officers of state. Thus Phidon and Argos and several others were originally kings, and ended by becoming tyrants. Phalaris, on the other hand, and the Ionian tyrants, acquired the tyranny by holding great offices. Whereas Panetius at Leontini, Sipsilus at Corinth, Pisistratus at Athens, Dionysius at Syracuse, and several others who afterwards became tyrants, were at first demagogues. And so, as I was saying, royalty ranks with aristocracy, for it is based upon merit, whether of the individual or of his family, or on benefits conferred, or on these claims with power added to them. For all who have obtained this honor have benefited, or had in their power to benefit, states and nations. Some, like Codrus, have prevented the state from being enslaved in war. Others, like Cyrus, have given their country freedom, or have settled or gained a territory like the Lacedaemonian, Macedonian, and Molossian kings. The idea of a king is to be a protector of the rich against unjust treatment, of the people against insult and oppression, whereas a tyrant, as has often been repeated, has no regard to any public interest, except as conducive to his private ends. His aim is pleasure, the aim of a king, honor. Wherefore also in their desires they differ. The tyrant is desirous of riches, the king of what brings honor, and the guards of a king are citizens, but of a tyrant mercenaries. That tyranny has all the vices both of democracy and oligarchy is evident. As of oligarchy, so of tyranny, the end is wealth, for by wealth only can the tyrant maintain either his guard or his luxury. Both mistrust the people, and therefore deprive them of their arms. Both agree, too, in injuring the people, and driving them out of the city and dispersing them. From democracy, tyrants have borrowed the art of making war upon the notables, and destroying them secretly or openly, or of exiling them because they are rivals, and stand in the way of their power, and also because plots against them are contrived by men of this das, who either want to rule or to escape subjection. Hence Periander advised Thrasybulus by cutting off the tops of the tallest ears of corn, meaning that he must always put out of the way the citizens who overtop the rest. And so, as I have already intimated, the beginnings of change are the same in monarchies as in forms of constitutional government, 
subjects attack their sovereigns out of fear or contempt, or because they have been unjustly treated by them. And of injustice, the most common form is insult. Another is confiscation of property. The ends sought by conspiracies against monarchies, whether tyrannies or royalties, are the same as the ends sought by conspiracies against other forms of government. Monarchs have great wealth and honor, which are objects of desire to all mankind. The attacks are made sometimes against their lives, sometimes against the office, where the sense of insult is the motive against their lives. Any sort of insult, and there are many, may stir up anger, and when men are angry, they commonly act out of revenge and not from ambition. For example, the attempt made upon the Posistratidae arose out of the public dishonor offered to the sister of Harmodius, and the insult to himself. He attacked the tyrant for his sister's sake, and Aristogiton joined in the attack for the sake of Harmodius. A conspiracy was also formed against Periander, the tyrant of Ambracia, because, when drinking with a favored youth, he asked him whether by this time he was not with child by him. Philip, too, was attacked by Pausanias, because he permitted him to be insulted by Attalus and his friends, and Amentus the Little by Dirtus, because he boasted of having enjoyed his youth. Evagoras of Cyprus, again, was slain by the eunuch to revenge an insult, for his wife had been carried off by Evagoras's son. Many conspiracies have originated in shameful attempts made by sovereigns on the persons of their subjects. Such was the attack of Critias upon Archelaus. He had always hated the connection with him, and so when Archelaus, having promised him one of his two daughters in marriage, did not give him either of them, but broke his word and married the elder to the king of Alamea, when he was hard-pressed in a war against Cyrus and Arabius, and the younger to his own son Amentus, under the idea that Amentus would then be less likely to quarrel with his son by Cleopatra, Critias made this slight a pretext for attacking Archelaus, though even a less reason would have sufficed, for the real cause of the estrangement was the disgust which he felt at his connection with the king. And from a like motive, Helenocrates of Larissa conspired with him, for when Archelaus, who was his lover, did not fulfill his promise of restoring him to his country, he thought that the connection between them had originated not in affection, but in the wantonness of power. Pytho too and Heraclides of Enus slew Cottus in order to avenge their father, and Adamus revolted from Cottus in revenge for the wanton outrage which he had committed in mutilating him when a child. Many, too, irritated at blows inflicted on the person which they deemed an insult, have either killed or attempted to kill officers of state and royal princes by whom they have been injured. Thus at Mytilene, Megacles and his friends attacked and slew the Penthilidae, as they were going about and striking people with clubs. At a later date, Smyrtus, who had been beaten and torn away from his wife by Penthilus, slew him. In the conspiracy against Archelaus, Decamnicus stimulated the fury of the assassins and led the attack. He was enraged because Archelaus had delivered him to Euripides to be scourged, for the poet had been irritated at some remark made by Decamnicus on the foulness of his breath. Many other examples might be cited of murders and conspiracies which have arisen from similar causes. Fear is another motive which, as we have said, has caused conspiracies as well in monarchies as in more popular forms of government. Thus Artapanes conspired against Xerxes and slew him, fearing that he would be accused of hanging Darius against his orders, he having been under the impression that Xerxes would forget what he had said in the middle of a meal, and that the offense would be forgiven. Another motive is contempt, as in the case of Sardanapalus, whom someone saw carting wool with his women, if the storytellers say truly, and the tale may be true, if not of him, of someone else. Dion attacked the younger Dionysius because he despised him, and saw that he was equally despised by his own subjects, and that he was always drunk. Even the friends of a tyrant will sometimes attack him out of contempt, for the confidence which he reposes in them breeds contempt, and they think that they will not be found out. The expectation of success is likewise a sort of contempt. The assailants are ready to strike, and think nothing of the danger, because they seem to have the power in their hands. Thus generals of armies attack monarchs, as, for example, Cyrus attacked Astyages, 
despising the effeminacy of his life, and believing that his power was worn out. Thus again Seuthes the Thracian conspired against Amaticus, whose general he was. And sometimes men are actuated by more than one motive, like Mithridates, who conspired against Ariobarzanes, partly out of contempt and partly from the love of gain. Bold natures, placed by their sovereigns in a high military position, are most likely to make the attempt in the expectation of success, for courage is emboldened by power, and the union of the two inspires them with the hope of an easy victory. Attempts of which the motive is ambition arise in a different way as well as in those already mentioned. There are men who will not risk their lives in the hope of gains and honors, however great, but who nevertheless regard the killing of a tyrant simply as an extraordinary action which will make them famous and honorable in the world. They wish to acquire not a kingdom, but a name. It is rare, however, to find such men. He who would kill a tyrant must be prepared to lose his life if he fail. He must have the resolution of Dion, who, when he made war upon Dionysius, took with him very few troops, saying, that whatever measure of success he might attain would be enough for him, even if he were to die the moment he landed. Such a death would be welcome to him. This is a temper to which few can attain. Once more, tyrannies, like all other governments, are destroyed from without by some opposite and more powerful form of government. That such a government will have the will to attack them is clear, for the two are opposed in principle and all men, if they can, do what they will. Democracy is antagonistic to tyranny, on the principle of Hesiod, Potter hates Potter, because they are nearly akin. For the extreme form of democracy is tyranny, and royalty and aristocracy are both alike opposed to tyranny, because they are constitutions of a different type. And therefore the Lacedaemonians put down most of the tyrannies, and so did the Syracusans during the time when they were well governed. Again, tyrannies are destroyed from within, when the reigning family are divided among themselves, as that of Gelo was, and more recently that of Dionysius. In the case of Gelo, because Thrasybulus, the brother of Hiero, flattered the son of Gelo, and led him into excesses in order that he might rule in his name. Whereupon the family got together a party to get rid of Thrasybulus, and save the tyranny but those of the people who conspired with them seized the opportunity and drove them all out. In the case of Dionysius, Dion, his own relative, attacked and expelled him with the assistance of the people. He afterwards perished himself. There are two chief motives which induce men to attack tyrannies, hatred and contempt. Hatred of tyrants is inevitable, and contempt is also a frequent cause of their destruction. Thus we see that most of those who have acquired have retained their power, but those who have inherited have lost it almost at once, for, living in luxurious ease, they have become contemptible, and offer many opportunities to their assailants. Anger, too, must be included under hatred, and produces the same effects. It is oftentimes even more ready to strike. The angry are more impetuous in making an attack, for they do not follow rational principle. And men are very apt to give way to their passions when they are insulted. To this cause is to be attributed the fall of the Pusistrotity, and of many others. Hatred is more reasonable, for anger is accompanied by pain, which is an impediment to reason, whereas hatred is painless. In a word, all the causes which I have mentioned as destroying the last and most unmixed form of oligarchy, and the extreme form of democracy, may be assumed to affect tyranny. Indeed, the extreme forms of both are only tyrannies distributed among several persons. Kingly rule is little affected by external causes, and is therefore lasting. It is generally destroyed from within. And there are two ways in which destruction may come about. One, when the members of the royal family quarrel among themselves, and two, when the kings attempt to administer the state too much after the fashion of a tyranny, and to extend their authority contrary to the law. Royalties do not now come into existence, where such forms of government arise, they are rather monarchies or tyrannies. For the rule of a king is over voluntary subjects, 
and he is supreme in all important matters. But in our own day, men are more upon an equality, and no one is so immeasurably superior to others as to represent adequately the greatness and dignity of the office. Hence mankind will not, if they can help, endure it, and any one who obtains power by force or fraud is at once thought to be a tyrant. In hereditary monarchies, a further cause of destruction is the fact that kings often fall into contempt, and although possessing not tyrannical powers, but only royal dignity, are apt to outrage others. Their overthrow is then readily effected, for there is an end to the king when his subjects do not want to have him, but the tyrant lasts, whether they like him or not. The destruction of monarchies is to be attributed to these and the like causes. End of Book 5, Section 10